And then my last introduction in terms of planning officers is also to introduce a new member of staff who started as, with us this week, but Rebecca Buckley, uh, a senior planning officer. Um, I can also quickly introduce uh, Philippa Long and Elizabeth Laughlin, who are colleagues from Environmental Health, and they will be assisting if necessary on the solar farm application. And online is Katie Jones, uh, the area engineer, who will assist with any advice on access and highway related issues if required. Right, thank you. Can I give my apologies for not being able to attend the site meetings yesterday? <laughs> For, uh, dramatic reasons which I won't go into here, but can I also thank Councillor Hardwick for leading the leading the visit site visits yesterday. Okay. Apologies for absence. We have received apologies from Councillors Johnson and Bolter. Um, a local ward member, Council Grafthree, has provided apologies. Her apologies. Name substitutes. Councillor Shaw for Councillor Johnson. Are there any other substitutes? No. Please, can I now ask if anyone wishes to declare an interest and the call each councillor separately? Councillor, yeah. I want to declare an interest in Foxwood Farm. <coughs> councillor Hardwick. Yeah, um, agenda item eight. I know the applicants. It's also joining the. Uh, Quite valley area of eight sand natural beauty. Are there any other declarations of interest? Oh, yeah, on. sorry, um, Chair. Yes, I'm also a member of the Wye Valley AUMB Joint Advisory Committee, um, but um, I'm following, that's right. following orders. Following right. orders. <laughs> right. Are there are no other public, um, declarations. <coughs> Can I now move on to the minutes of the meeting held on the 8th of February? There were no matters um, notified of, of, of substance to the monitoring officer. Can I ask those in favour, please indicate. <coughs> right. No objections? Right. That is carried. Then now I have no announcements. Can we now um, move on to the first item. Can I request the public speakers present in person for the agenda item six of the meeting? A Withington Group PC, Mr. Rowlett, Mrs. Green from um, PC uh, from, the, uh, from the parish council, Mrs. Rowlett from the local resident, and Mrs. Izanov um, at the applicant's agent. Please take your seats in the public gallery. Thank you. Can I welcome you to the meeting? Um, I'll ask you to speak when the after the presentation from the relevant officer. Can I now move to the item land adjacent to uh, Northwest West Hyde West Hyde Herefordshire? I ask gentlemen to make the presentation. Yes. Good morning and thank you Chairman and to all members of the planning committee who attended the site visit yesterday. The application in front of you today seeks, seeks permission for a solar generating facility with a capacity of 25.1 megawatts from 45,684 individual solar panels. The application has been redirected to the planning committee by Councillor Andrews, <coughs> who's the local ward member of the Hagley Ward. The application site is identified in the usual manner by the Red Star and is within the parish of West Hyde. <coughs> the export generation from the proposed solar farm will be enough to generate electricity for 9,098 homes. All of the electricity to be generated from the site will be fed directly into the national grid by the Hereford substation at Dormington. The baseline route of the cabling for the connection falls outside of the planning process. However, it has been confirmed by the applicant uh, that the route is largely to be across agricultural land and will consist of underground cabling. Members should note that the proposal can be considered or is considered a temporary use of the land with the development indicated as having a 30 year lifespan after which the site can be fully decommissioned and the land restored to agriculture. Next slide. 
Okay, so this first slide provides a visual context of the wider application site, which extends to 61.7 uh, hectares of agricultural land within the parish of West Hyde. The application site is outlined in red and has access points to the south onto the C1131 highway and to the north via the farmstead <coughs> of Thinch Hill Court. West Hyde is a small rural parish located between the A4103 Hereford to Worcester Road, which is to the south, and the A465 Bromyard Road to the north. The small, the small settlement of West Hyde is located around six miles northeast of the city of Hereford. Members will note from the, from the plan at the top that the village of Withington is located approximately two miles southeast of West Hyde and the small village of Oakle Pritchard is to the north. Members should also note the presence of the Three Choirs Way, which is a long distance footpath between the three cathedral cities of Gloucester, Worcester and Hereford. The location of the path is identified on the, the plan in green to the north of the application site. Also of note is the former Hereford to Gloucester Canal route, which forms the northern boundary of the site and is, and is identifiable on the aerial image by the line of trees on the northern boundary of the site. Members should also note um, from the aerial photograph the presence of polytunnels to the north of the application site. These polytunnels are, are at Oakle Pritchard and were approved by the committee in, in 2019. The aerial image identifies the area as a rural parish with a mixture of land uses and farming practices, which include polytunnels to the north and west of the site. There are many small blocks of woodland within the landscape, including the elevated West Hyde woodland, which is located to the south of the site. Next slide, please. Okay, the application site, um, as already um, stated, is to the north of the C1131 highway, which runs between the villages of Withington and the small settlement of West Hyde. Members should note that the solar panels and infrastructure are set back from the highway by some 525 metres. The village of Withington, located to the southeast of the applica application site, has its own conservation area with a grade two star church at its centre. Members visiting the site yesterday would have noted there are several dwellings located between the villages of Withington and the small settlement of West Hyde, which include a small cluster of dwellings at Dodmarsh and the residential dwelling located close to the access point where we accessed the site yesterday. There are further individual dwellings located along the highway either side um, of the main centre of West Hyde. Members would have noted yesterday that the local landscape is considered to be low lying with the topography of the site consisting of a gentle slope in a northern direction towards the canal route. On the site visit, members would have noted the variation in the topography in the surrounding area, as well as the several small blocks of the road. The land rises to the south on the opposite side of the highway towards the local high point, West Hyde Wood and Shucknell Hill, with a rolling topography to the west towards the village of Withington. The route of the Three Choirs Way is shown on this plan by the pink dashed line to the north. Members should note that there are other footpaths within the surrounding area, which include two <coughs> footpaths which leave West Hyde Village itself, itself in, a south, in a southerly direction up into the West Hyde Wood and elevated ground. I would point out at this, at, at this stage that there are no public footpaths on the site itself. South. However, as part of the proposal, a, a circular permissive path is being offered around the boundaries of the site and along the route of the former canal with access points from the east and the south of the site for the local community to enjoy. Next slide please. So as the, my report identifies, um, there has been uh, amendments to the scheme during the application process. As outlined within the report, the proposal was amended significantly in scale to reflect concerns raised by officers and local residents in connection with the loss of agricultural land. The proposed application site extends to 61.7 hectares. The proposal on its original submission was to generate 34.6 megawatts of energy with panels and associated infrastructure spanning over eight fields. This is shown on the original master plan, which is at the top of this slide. The amended mass plan and the proposal which is in front of you today for consideration is shown on the bottom of the slide. 
The panels and associated infrastructure are now spread across only three fields to the north and west of the site. The application boundary has remained the same. This is to allow the, a landscaping and biodiversity enhancement across the wider site to remain. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows the agricultural land classification across the site. Agricultural land classification is a material planning consideration for, for development of this nature and scale and full consideration has been given to the loss of agricultural production on the land during the lifetime of the development. The agricultural land classification was also the significant factor which influenced the amendments which have occurred to the scale of the proposal. The clarification for members, the best most versatile agricultural land are grades 1, 2 and 3A. Both local and national policy seek to protect the best, most versatile land where possible from non-agricultural developments. The application was supported with an agricultural land classification report. The plan at the bottom of this slide identifies the classification of land across the site, with the two, shade, with the two shades of blue identifying land which is grade 1 and 2, whilst the dark green in the centre of the site is the land classified as 3A. <coughs> The light green to the north of the site is land identified as 3B, which is outside of the classification for best most versatile land, and is land which was identified as having a poorer quality when it comes to agricultural production. In recognition of the concerns raised by local residents and officers, the applicants removed all land identified in grades 1 and 2, as well as the majority of land in 3A. This land has remained within the application site boundary to allow for landscaping and biodiversity enhancement. However, it will re remain in agricultural production. The scheme in front of you today now covers 23 hectares of, three, of grade 3B land, which equates to 96% of all the land to be covered by solar panels and associated infrastructure. The remaining 4% of land is, um, is grade 3A. In terms of the loss of agricultural land, Natural England ha have been consulted and raised no, no objection to the loss of agricultural land, largely citing the temporary nature of the proposal, which allows the land to return to agricultural production. Next slide, please. As identified on site yesterday, the application proposes a temporary access route for the construction traffic to the north of the site via the farmstead Thinchill Court, which is located just off the A465. Construction of the site is expected to take 25 weeks with 55 two-way two trips on average. The majority of the construction traffic will access the site via the farmstead from the A465 uh, to the north of the farm and then exit by Thinchill Lane to the south, back onto the A465, forming a one-way system. The proposed construction track will lead from the existing agricultural facility running across three fields to join the existing access point into the site over the former canal. Once operational, the development will generate on average two vehicle movements a month, with vehicles accessing the site from the south via the access which members used yesterday. The application has been supported with a construction traffic management plan, which has been amended during the course of the application to reflect the amendments made. The access point from the highway does not require any upgrade to accommodate the construction vehicles, with the access meeting visibility requirements in both directions. Members will note a condition is included to ensure details of site compound and parking for site operatives is submitted for approval prior to the commencement of any works to ensure compliance with policy MT1 of the core strategy. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the solar panels. The solar panels are to be mounted in rows across the site in an east to west orientation to face south at 10 degrees from the horizontal to maximise efficiency. The panels are to be arranged in four arrays across the, the three fields, with 2.5 metre gaps between each row. The panels are to be mounted <coughs> on galvanised steel frame and stacked in module tables of six panels high, giving a width of 6.7 metres, with the length of each row varying across each area. <coughs> the ground underneath the panels are to be planted with native wildflowers, 
No agricultural grazing is to occur during the lifetime of the development, which will allow the ground to recover and reduce the phosphate runoff entering the local river system. The majority of the panels across the site will be three metres high. However, however, <coughs> the southern edge of field G, um, which is the closest um, to West Hyde, uh, will have a maximum height of 2.5 metres from the ground. Next slide, please. <coughs> the, site, the site south will be surrounded with security fencing which will stand 2.5 metres high and will be constructed from deer netting attached to six foot wooden post. Galvanised steel access gates will be used to gain vehicle access into the site. Mammal gates are to be installed within the fence as shown on the bottom plan and the fence will also support CCTV security cameras which will be located around the site. Next slide, please. This next slide shows the inverters. The proposed scheme includes six inverters around the site. <coughs> inverters are all positioned within the centre of the site within shipping style containers measuring 2.8 by 1.5 metres with a height of 2.3 metres. The inverters consist of an electrical converter which charges the direct current electricity captured by the solar panels into alternating current, which is the standard flow of electricity required for the electrical circuits. Six inverters are recognised as the potential for the main source of noise from the development. A number of local residents have raised concerns in relation to the noise from the, from the inverters. The application has been supported with a noise impact assessment, which uh, assesses the noise from the inverters and the proposed substation at the nearest noise sensitive receptors. In light of the concerns raised by local residents, the Council's Environmental Health Officers have spent time on site and considered all representations and the report fully. <coughs> the comments on, of the Environmental Health Officers are reported in paragraph 4.13 of the report and you will see that there, were, there was concerns with the background noise levels at night identified within the report and which was also highlighted by locals. Having spent time on site when assessing the proposal, the environmental health officers used the lower 23 decibel noise levels for the background nighttime noise. Using the methodology found in BS 4142 2014, officers have concluded that the proposal will have a low impact at the nearest receptor in relation to noise. The amended plans have significantly increased the distance between the location of the inverters and all residential properties in West Hyde. Um, as well as those located towards the village of Withington. At their closest, an inverter would be around 540 metres from the property Ashgrove, which is located directly south of the site, close to the access point where members parked yesterday. Other res residential properties include Lower Farm and Townsend Farm to the east, which are distances of between 630 and 650 metres from an inverter, and properties to the southwest in Dodmarsh located around 630 and 650 metres also from the substation and the inverters. Given the topography of the site and the intervening vegetation, the proposal is considered to have a low impact at the nearest residential properties in terms of noise and nuisance. However, in recognition of the concerns raised by local residents, a noise management plan has been recommended at condition 13. The noise management plan shall be reviewed annually and shall monitor and respond to any complaints made by local residents. Next slide, please. This next slide shows the proposed distribution network operated substation, which is to be located on the southern boundary of field C, in front of an existing small woodland, which is to be retained. <coughs> The substation covers an area of 46 by 24 metres and will contain various components, including a transformer high level disconnector and control room. The substation will be surrounded by a security fencing standing at 2.4 metres and will connect to the Dormington substation via underground cables. The infrastructure within the substation compound will not exceed 5.6 metres. Next slide, please. <coughs> This next slide um, shows the drainage, drainage strategy. 
In terms of site drainage, the proposal has been amended during the application process in consultation with the council's drainage engineers. The scheme is largely within flood zone one, although the banks of the former canal to the north of the site are identified as being in flood zone three. A said scheme has now been designed to capture the runoff from the panels and recognises the impact that a solar farm can have on the greenfield rates and runoff. It is proposed that the surface water from rain pouring onto the panels will be captured and diverted via proposed ditches to an attenuation basin located adjacent to the proposed substation on the southern boundary of field C. In the area shaded orange on the plan, a proposed swale is proposed to capture the water as the topography of the site does not allow for a gravity fed connection in that area. Council's drainage engineers are satisfied, are satisfied that the scale and design of the drainage scheme will ensure that the, that the development will not increase flooding in the area and provides a sustainable water management scheme which is compliant with policy SD3 of the core strategy. Next slide please. This next slide is the proposed landscaping mitigation and biodiversity enhancement. The landscaping plan has been amended and added to at various stages of the application to take into account comments in representations and comments made by the council's own landscape officer. The main components, components of the landscaping scheme, scheme is to reinforce and strengthen all the hedgerows and field boundaries, allowing hedgerows and vegetation to grow in height. Across the site, there are a number of new stretches of hedgerows. This includes along the northern boundary of the site, along the line of the security fencing, with a significant number of new trees. In the center of the site, between fields D and E, there are a number of new trees being planted, which members would have seen or have, um, in place yesterday. Members would have noted from the site visit that a significant proportion of the planting proposed has already been installed with mature trees of heights of above three meters in height. Part of the objective of the planting scheme is to reinstate the historic field boundaries and enhance the connectivity of natural features, including the isolated woodland blocks along the boundary. As previously mentioned, there will be a permissive path, for the local community around the whole site, allowing access to the former canal routes and new landscape corridors. The permissive path provides a circular route around the site with access points from the eastern and southern boundaries. Next slide, please. So just moving on to some photos around the site and areas of specific landscaping. The plan at the top of this slide shows the landscaping in field A, which is the most southern field closest to the highway. The pond within the field is to be reinstated with wildlife corridors provided um, around the edges of the pond and fields. And this will especially help the great crested newts, which are on site. There is new tree planting along the hedge with the field, <coughs> with the woodland to the south and west to be retained under management of the West Hyde estate during the lifetime of the solar farm. Next slide, please. Um, again, further plans around the site. These plans are areas to the northern um, boundary, which adjoins the canal routes. In these areas, the landscape scheme will provide further wildlife cor corridors and, and with proposed wild bird seed mix and ecological buffers provided. Members would have noted on site yesterday, um, the further north into the site, the topography and existing vegetation on boundaries and, wide, and within the wider landscape, um, these don't allow for views out of the site. And likewise, there will be limited views of the panels from public vantage points due to the topography and intervening vegetation. Next slide, please. Um, these photos provide more views across the site. So the top picture is of field D, <coughs> oh, which, is, <coughs> which is no longer proposed to be covered in panels. However, the proposal does reinstate a species-rich species hedgerow along the centre between fields D and E. The bottom picture is of that of field F, which adjoins the canal. Members will note that all ponds across the site are, be, are to be retained and veteran trees have been given protection with appropriate stands off of infrastructure. Next slide, please. This final picture is taken from the corner of field A where members stood yesterday. Everything green in this picture is not to be covered in solar panels, with the panels located to the north identified in this picture 
uh, as a light yellow colour. The picture illustrates the gentle change in topography across the site with the land rolling gently north towards the tree-lined canal. The hedgerows you can see in this picture will be enhanced and managed and maintained to grow in heights um, with a number of new trees already planted. As the proposed planting matures, the adverse effects of the development on the landscape would be reduced and would be acceptable. The 30-year lifespan of the proposed development is significant. However, officers are satisfied that once the solar farm has been decommissioned, there would be no residual, residual adverse landscape effect. The proposed mitigation is consistent with the landscape character, and once the development has been decommissioned, there would be no impact, uh, no lasting impact. Next slide, please. <coughs> So to conclude, in terms of planning policy, both local and national policy clearly support proposals which generate renewable energy and recognise the role that planning must pay, must pay in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and meeting renewable energy targets. Crucially, the national planning policy framework advises that applications for renewable energy should be approved if impacts are or can be made acceptable, unless there are material considerations which indicate otherwise. Applications of this nature and scale when it will inevitably impact upon the local environment. The application in front of you today has been supported by a range of technical reports and surveys and detailed drawings and has been developed and amended following public <coughs> consultation and pre-application engagement. There are no physical constraints, constraints which limit early development of the site and a grid, connect, a grid connection offer has been secured. As such, this scheme could make an early and significant contribution to the objectives of achieving the government target in clean growth set for 2050. There are a number of considerations that weigh in favour of the proposed development. With regards to ecology, as just discussed, the scheme includes the provision of native hedgerows, native rich grassland planting. Overall, the proposal offers 69% increase in biodiversity net gain. gain. The Council's Ecologist has not identified any significant harm and conditions are recommended to secure further details for biodiversity measures and enhancement. Throughout the application process, full consideration has been given to the neighbouring residential properties. It is recognised that there is concern locally that the proposal could generate a noise and nuisance which could have an adverse impact upon the residential amenity. However, having spent time on site and through the amendments which have been made, officers are <coughs> satisfied that the proposal will not have an adverse impact on the nearby properties. The hardest consideration with this application has been that of the impacts on landscape character and visual immunity. All of the representations received have raised concerns on these grounds. A proposal of this scale and nature will inevitably harm, have an impact on the surrounding landscape. However, the significant amendments which have been made um, have reduced the harm to the appearance of visual immunity of the area. There will still be glimpses of the development from higher ground and when viewed from sections of the public right of way. It is acknowledged that all proposed planting and reinforcement of hedgerows will take time to develop and mature. However, the applicant has already shown a commitment with a, with a significant proportion of the planting already installed. The proposal would introduce a large development of industrial appearance, which will fundamentally change the character of the immediate landscape for the duration of the development. However, given the general topography of the area, the effects of the solar array on the overall landscape character would be limited to the immediate landscape setting, and the adverse effects would be limited and localised. As the report and application submission demonstrate, there are environmental benefits in terms of renewable energy and a net gain in habitat biodiversity. The greatest significant benefit of the scheme is considered to be the imperative to tackle climate change as recognised in legislation and energy policies which clearly and decisively outweigh the temporary and less than substantial harm to the visual landscape immunity in the locality. Drawing all of the issues together and taking all material considerations into account, as outlined within my report, it is considered that the proposal would make a material contribution to the objectives of tackling climate change and achieving the decarbonisation of energy production. On balance, it is not considered that any adverse impacts would significantly and demonstrably outweigh this benefit. 
<clears throat> the proposal is therefore considered an acceptable form of development that accords with the objectives of the relevant national and local policies as a whole. The application is therefore recommended for approval, subject to the conditions set out in my report. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> and now I invite uh, Ms Green on behalf of Witherington Group Parish Council to speak. You have three minutes. We wish to object. This proposed development is for circa 46,000 three metre high solar panels covering the equivalent of 45 football fields in West Hyde, a rural, undeveloped, and tranquil hamlet. This enormous temporary installation will last more than a generation, and to quote the appeal outcome from the Molens Farm Limington, the reversibility of the proposal is not a matter to which weight should be given. 30 years would not be perceived by those who frequent the area as being temporary, and the harmful effect on the landscape would prevail for far too long. Have you, our parish, to share? Respondents have overwhelmingly been against this development. The initial noise survey was disputed and baseline background data at noise at West Hyde has now been confirmed at just 23 decibels. The majority of residents lay to the east of the proposed site. The closest residence just 540 metres from the substation, which will emit a loud mechanical hum 24-7. The noise impact modelling does not consider prevailing wind from the west at current outstanding point of query. We are concerned that the inverters and substation will become even noisy with age and during hot weather due to cooling fans. <coughs> Parishioners can hear ducks on the reservoir one and a half kilometres away, making it apparent the substation and inverters, both of which will emit a constant high pitched hum, would be heard by residents, neg negatively impacting value amenity. There are houses which neighbour the site on flood zone three. We question the credibility of the model data and analysis provided. In the drainage plan stated January 2023, they state the Environment Agency data did not provide sufficient detail to facilitate an accurate assessment, resulting in them using a model being produced to define the floodplain and determine potential depths of flooding. Figure 6.1 in that plan shows the model flood extent map, which is contradictory to the publicly available flood risk data. The Kimmin Brook floods regularly, which has caused Kimmin Cottage to flood three times since 1997, up to 30 centimetres, with water encroaching other properties. The model data shows the risk of this area is just one millimetre once in every 100 years. Clearly, this data is inaccurate. The sun's design specifies a 2.6 metre wide swale for field G. This swale will build directly into the existing water course. This additional water from the swale will likely hinder the discharge of the Kimmin Brook, increasing the risk of further flood damage to the homes in the Kimmin. The report repeatedly references the River Kale. We do not believe the drainage assessment modelling or report is credible, the risk therefore not been mitigated. This solar development poses a real flood risk to our flood risk to our residents. West Hyde is deeply rural tr with tranquil field views. This proposed development will industrialise the landscape, not just with the 46,000 three metre high panels, but also the two and a half metre high security fencing, lighting and CCTV surrounding each field, which will impact amenity and result in substantial harm to the landscape due to the dominant and uncharacteristic development, which is in conflict with the following policies. LD1, SD1, RA6, SD2, SS6 from the Herefordshire Local Plan, and the MPPF paragraph 17, 109, 113, 155, and 170, as well as our own NDP. The Wellington site, which you rejected in 2016, as the intrinsic character and scenic beauty of the countryside was recognised, highlighting that the harm to landscape would outweigh any benefits under the policies of SD2, LD1, and SS6 of the core strategy. And that site backed onto the A49 and was not the centre of a rural and undeveloped ham hamlet. The West Hyde scheme is three times larger than the Wellington proposal. This proposal also sit, predominantly sits on 3B land, which is still excellent quality. As a parish, we are in favour of solar, but this up. site is not the right site. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Can I now invite Mr. Rowlett, a local resident, who is to speak in objection to the planning application? Mr. Rowlett. Thank you. <clears throat> I first came to Hereford in 1977. My childhood home was rural Buckinghamshire. I went to school holidays, I used to work on a local farm. I was a country boy. I wanted to be a farm, but instead, the game was sold. I now live in Herod. In 1986, we moved into the old vicarage right opposite St. Mark Bartholomew's Church in the village of West Hyde, which you saw on the plan earlier. <clears throat> I think all of us here understand the absolute necessity to develop green energy for the good of our environment, something we all buy into. Yesterday, I accompanied the councillors uh, for their walk around the site. Uh, deer sign clearly visible in the wet mud, buzzards mewing overhead. This locality is not only undeniably beautiful, it is also busy, vibrant, and productive. 
The plans on the table include measures to protect the environment and increase biodiversity. There will be some losers. Dear the Kestrels and the Sparrows, the Sparrows are not. <clears throat> we do appreciate the enormous effort of all of you have put into this. <clears throat> but as you have, as now been illustrated, we do have uh, these concerns, particularly with regard to flooding and to noise. Uh, the canal, presumably, could be utilised uh, as a water holding area, <clears throat> and perhaps develop that as a community benefit, of which we don't see a great deal in this plan as it stands. And commissioning. Uh, should we consider decommissioning? Decommissioning this site in 30 years' time would be an expensive proposal. Uh, how is that to be funded? If such a project had been started when I first moved here, it would have reached the end of its uh, planned lifetime by now. We cannot tell. We do have a duty to consider the legacy that we will leave for those that follow, and specifically our children. This is a deeply rural area, pastoral in nature, screened by woodland and shut in hills to the south and by gently undulating landscapes to the north. Attracted to visitors, walkers and ramblers, something we should wish to continue and to protect. However, it has been described as the country but on country file, as England's most agrarious county. <coughs> if parts of it have to be sacrificed to produce green energy, then we have to accept that. Is it necessary? Is the scale unreasonable? These things should be considered within the context of a wider locality. A large acreage of polytunnels already in place, 50 acres of apple trees that have been rubbed out this quite recently. Uh, here we have an expansion of industrialization in the rural area that surely we need to start. Regarding alternatives, I haven't studied that, but I'm sure that we have come nowhere near to exhausting other possibilities for this kind of I've spoken to a number of villagers, not all, and I try, I strive today to reflect a collective view here. We believe the proposed development will inflict substantial harm on the landscape and does not respect the form, character and setting of the locality. And to reiterate, we have a duty to consider our legacy. Okay. And Can I ask this to find out more? Sorry, we've reached the three minutes, so I've got to be equal between no, us. I've got no problem. I've got to start my clock. I do apologize. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Apologies about that. Can I now invite uh, Ms. Isiano to, um, sorry about the pronunciation, but uh, uh, to give her uh, um, presentation uh, in support of the application. Thank you. Um, we have conducted significant levels of consultation uh, with the local community over the past two years, and this has resulted in many changes to our proposals. Uh, which has included the removal of solar infrastructure from all fields containing BMB land and relocating the substation location from its original position to increase distance of properties, providing additional assessments upon requests such as noise surveys, changing the construction access route and the grid cable route in response to local concerns, and these two now completely avoid the villages of West Hyde and Winton, increasing the amount and type of screening planting, creating additional habitats and adding four and a half kilometres of views of park. We appreciate that despite these efforts, not everyone is supportive of the proposal. Some people have ongoing concerns, especially in relation to noise. Uh, we are willing to comply with any noise mitigation planning conditions that the council would like to propose. And we want to reassure the community and the committee that we will continue to work closely with the entire community on these issues going forward. We hope this proposal is viewed within the wider context of the climate biodiversity, energy security and cost of living crises uh, currently being experienced both nationally and globally, and the critical role that solar power and the scheme can play. On a national level, there are escalating energy security issues that are significantly driving the cost of living crisis currently affecting the UK. We must increase our dependence on expensive and unreliable sources of imported fossil fuels and increase the levels of domestically generated energy, of which solar is becoming a significant uh, contributor. Pembrokeshire Council declared a climate emergency in 2019. The green electricity and carbon savings benefits of the scheme uh, will provide sufficient uh, energy to power 9,000 homes every year for 30 years, after which um, uh, the scheme will be decommissioned and land return to arable use. On a local level, uh, it will also uh, improve the ecology and biodiversity of the parish of West Hyde. Solar power is now the cheapest and quickest to deploy form of electricity generation in the UK. It is green, it is locally produced, and it is reliable. 
We have also put forward proposals for community benefit funds, which will be engaging with the parish council to agree on how best to uh, set up and administer. Lastly, I wanted to mention that food security is often mistakenly placed in opposition to energy security. While 70% of the UK's land is used for agriculture, only 0.08%, so not even 1%, is currently being used to generate solar power. If all the solar schemes currently planning were approved, they would still cover less land than the UK's gold prices. On balance, therefore, we um, believe that um, the UK can not only afford to set aside some farmland for domestic energy generation, but it actually must if we are to tackle these concurrent crises. Uh, for a county such as Herefordshire, finding a suitable low grade land is a challenge, <coughs> but at West Hyde we have a site which is almost entirely grade 3B land. This proposal therefore presents an unusual opportunity for Herefordshire to increase its renewable energy generation without jeopardising its important role in food production. Okay, thank you. thank you. Just Right, thank you all. Perhaps you can now take, please take your speakers, take their places in the public gallery. <coughs> <coughs> right. Um, the local member is Councillor. He speaks first and then has the right to speak at the end of the debate. He does not have a vote. Uh, he has 10 minutes time limit. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank everybody who could attend yesterday in the lovely part of West Hyde in my ward. It's much appreciated. Um, regarding this application, you've heard from obviously objectors, you've heard from the ap applicant agent. Um, with this, the main concerns of the parish of West Hyde, we've got to think of, so explain a bit of the what the Wivington Group Parish Council is. It's obviously West Hyde is Wivington, so it's a bit of a split. But the West Hyde residents have got great concerns about noise pollution on this development. Um, they have come up, you know, basically, yeah, you know, obviously the NDP, Wivington Group policy, P13, renewable energy, renewable energy proposals that will benefit the community will be encouraged. They respect the raw character of the locality, <coughs> local and residential medias protect. It reflects the community needs. Now, obviously, we're an open countryside on this. Yes, it's great to be um, I thank what the office has done and the agents done it, and all the discussions have been having and retracted back on good quality land, but it's still agricultural land that's going to be used. Yes, we've got to outweigh the balance of green energy, renewable energy, obviously great source of protection for, for the country in producing our own energy. But with this, we've got to respect the local needs as well. When it comes to flooding, they have got issues, the Kimmin. There is a pond actually being designed to hold the water, but then the water's got to be released. Now, I would like to see if there's other things can be done with holding the water and water dispersion, shall we say, in water courses. Like you've just heard, you know, there is a canal nearby. Obviously, it's not in the outline of this application, but it'd be a great source that could be opened up and actually retain water to protect people's property. And that is one thing we all got to do in this, in the climate change, we've got to address it, we've got to deal with it. There is certain things that I will bring to later after the discussion. Um, but like I say, have a look. The community is not industrialized. This will be an industrial scale. They have polytunnels to the west and the east of the site as it is. So it's been industrialized to a bit. So that areas of West Hyde and Oakal Pitchard and Wivington have been industrialized in a slight way anyway. But this is a grand scale of industrialization. You've got fences, you've got 
CCTV, which need to be there. I can understand that, but it's the, like I go back to the noise, the amenity of the land, the <coughs> landscape will be changed. It will be changed. Yes, 30 years time, we, some of us probably won't be around to see what happens when it's decommissioned. But like I say, there is a, probably other areas in Herefordshire that could be used, brainfield sites, and everything else. That's all I'm going to say at the moment. I think Jonathan Lester's going to... Right, right. thank Go you. On. Thank Councilor you. Anders. And Council Johnson Lester is the adjoining ward member. His ward is materially affected by the application, therefore he has a right to speak, the adjoining ward member. Ten minutes time limit also. Councillor Lester. Yes, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, jolly good, jolly good. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman, and thank you to those speakers. Uh, harvesting the sun's power to meet our increased energy needs sounds like the ideal solution, and therefore we can understand why officers are keen to support this uh, planning application. However, the issue is whether this committee should approve a scheme that by its very nature will have a dramatic impact on the area. When a proposal is for 40, over 45,000 solar panels, three metres in height, with all of the fencing and apparatus that is proposed, I cannot accept the idea that such a scheme will not have a negative effect on local communities, farmland and the landscape. I have many concerns about this application. Given the benefits of gaining power from solar panels, the crux of the matter for this committee is to consider whether the benefits outweigh the harm that would no doubt be caused by this proposal. With regard to the connection, uh, the grid connection information, um, there is only one and a half sides of A4 which state that a cable will be entrenched from West Hyde to Dormington. Now, whether that's three miles or four miles, I, I just don't know. But I cannot see what assessment has been made of the impact this substantial engineering operation will have, which will no doubt disrupt wildlife and the open countryside. The development is referred to as temporary with a lifespan of 30 years. Well, for me, two weeks is temporary and in some contacts, maybe even three months is temporary, uh, but 30 years is not temporary at all. In fact, it, in fe it will affect the environment uh, and it will be a substantial effect on that environment. And I would urge this committee not to consider this as temporary in any way. What this means is uh, 30 years of food production or agricultural production will have not taken place. Now, we know food security is a pressing matter, and this fact cannot be dismissed lightly, uh, even uh, and especially when you consider that we're talking about the length of time, which is a whole generation. Then there's the negative impact of the generator hum and the general concern about noise generation. I refer the committee to paragraph 6.74. Uh, and due to the concern that there may be noise, there's a, a, a mechanism to deal with the complaints, which will be reviewed annually. Uh, this isn't a sufficient mechanism, and the idea of just having to assess steps taken annually is just not robust enough for me, I'm afraid. Once those inverters are there, there's no getting rid of them to address noise complaints. The officers give their assessment by quoting the biodiversity improvements of 69.89% and habitat 59.06%. Um, they're saying that these gains attract significant weight in favour of the proposal. Well, I'm sure that the habitat and biodiversity would thrive much better without 45,000 solar panels. So I think this assessment must be met with sufficient scepticism. The long-term effect of solar panel placements on soil quality is just not known enough to establish that there will be no harm to the land quality as well as the uh, impacts on the wildlife. And given the need for more sources of energy, solar farms are obviously being presented as a solution to our energy needs. But this committee must not be lulled into the false dichotomy that if this application is not approved, it cannot happen elsewhere. The question before the committee is solely, is this the right place for the proposal? And it's not a debate about the virtues of, social, of, of solar technology. So we know there's widespread objection to the application in the area, and it's been cited in the report, and you've heard the comments of objectors today in your meeting. Um, 
The initial application proposals were rejected. However, I would again urge the committee not to view this as an application that just because it's been scaled down from what was a huge development, this is not now small enough to not be harmful. This committee is being asked to accept that over 45,000 solar panels will have a minor adverse or lower impact on the landscape and that tree planting which will take years to establish will mitigate the impact. I've always said consistently, any development that needs trees to hide it is bad development. I cannot accept that a 2.5 meter high fences and over 45,000 uh, solar panels, three meters high will not have a detrimental impact on the landscape. And the capacity of the scheme is cited at 25.1 megawatts. There is, uh, there's nothing in the presentation that I can see that uh, to, uh, to question this. However, I would assume that this is based on an optimistic appraisal of the proposal of the running of the facility. Um, God bless the English weather, but even with the best forecasts, there's no certainty that this energy yield will be consistently achieved. In summing up, Chair, um, I'd just like to read you a planning decision that Herefordshire Council made with regard to another planning application for a solar panel farm. Now, this one is, we are told, 23 acres, but the one that was considered before by Herefordshire Council was 10 acres. And the planning officer determination was the proposed development of 10 hectares of solar panels on this application site would result in a development which would have substantial harm to the landscape character by virtue of its scale, pattern of development and it lacks any relationship with existing development that would have and would have a detrimental impact that is out of keeping and doesn't respect <coughs> the form character or setting of the locality the size scale and nature of the proposal would result in a dominant and uncharacteristic form of development which introduces a series of uncharacteristic structures across open field together with security fencing and cameras causing unacceptable visual harm to the landscape character and appearance of the wider landscape uh, setting. For these reasons, the proposal would conflict with policies LD1 and SD1. So this was a decision that was refused. So it was appealed against. Well, what did the inspector say about 10 hectares? The site is part of a most attractive landscape and has a strong sense of scale and visual unity. And in my view, it's sensitive to change. Into this setting, the appeal proposal would introduce a fairly sizable solar farm and associated infrastructure, despite the density of the hedging and other vegetation, which would thin out significantly in autumn and winter months. 25 years is a significant period of time during which the impact of the scheme on landscape character would be experienced. At close range, it would be significantly harmed by ranks of solar panels and a utilitarian inverter station and CCTV poles. The stark semi-industrial appearance of the installation would be intrusive and markedly out of keeping with a tract of the scenic countryside, disrupting the harmonious pattern of open fields and eroding the qualities of principal settled farmlands landscape. If this is the determination of a much smaller scheme, then I would advise the committee that the same logic can be applied to this much larger proposal before you today. It suffers from the same issues as the sample example I've cited, but due to its scale, it's even worse. And therefore, there won't be mere glimpses at this scale. And that is why I would urge this committee to refuse this application. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Now I invite debate. Speakers. <coughs> Councillor Bowie. Um, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that's an interesting summation of the facts of the case from Councillor Lester and from our ward councillor as well. And certainly it is a major development. It is very large in the scale of Herefordshire, I believe. <clears throat> it's also in a very beautiful bit of country, as most of Herefordshire is, one has to say. There are other bits of this country that are much more suitable because they're much less interesting than Herefordshire, and that should be taken into account too, I think. Um, some minor, well, some points, I think. I think decommissioning is very important if it does get uh, passed, and we need to think very carefully, long in advance, before that point in time comes. 
uh, and funds we set aside for it and plans made. Uh, noise. This is a serious consideration for many local people. Uh, would the prospect of having double daisying given to them uh, ameliorate this, this matter, I wonder? It is a, it is a thought that perhaps we put into the developers' minds that that would be a good use of their funds to go to set, put set aside for the local community. Uh, it, they, I know a lot of people these days do have double daisy, but not everyone does. Possibly that might be some help as well. Clinton Glare are mentioned. Yes, well, we were told it's not too serious. But actually, it could be quite obtrusive, I think, especially with all the, the footpaths around the back. Uh, the canal, uh, it, it going right across the canal, has enough <clears throat> consideration been given to the restoration of the canal itself when this, these works are finished? And I suppose when it does get decommissioned, they'll be coming back across it. By then, of course, the canal might be in operation. Who knows? It was. So could we have a bit, bit more information about how the canal will be protected, how its banks, how its bed and everything else, and approaches will be properly looked after? Uh, I think there are a lot of points here, really. Uh, yes. So let's let's have some information on that, if we could, please. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Can, can we just have a clarification on that? Bearing in mind the canal it is a very active project to, in the county. The Councillor Polly Andrews, the late husband, was the founding member, I think, of the, of the, of the canal, but her of Gloucester Canal Society. Um, so there is policies both within the core strategy and within the Withington NDP in terms of the protection of the canal, um, in terms of reinstatement um, of the canal, um, and as it's connected with tourism in terms of providing access to the canal. Um, now the, the applicants worked quite hard at, at ensuring that there is an easement, so um, the all infrastructure is, is set um, that I think nine metres back from the edge of the canal. Um, the permissive path which is being offered actually allows access to the canal also, so it will also allow members of the local, local community, um, but also anybody visiting the local area, um, to access the, the, um, access the canal corridor also. During the 30 years, if an application is received, or proposals are received um, to reinstate the canal, um, this development will not, um, will not impact that coming forward. So, they've ensured by allowing that nine metre easement. Any proposal that does come forward um, will be able to be carried out. But in the meantime, it, what it does allow is access to the canal so people can appreciate the, the former route of the canal um, <coughs> as well. Right, thank you. Councillor Norman. <clears throat> thank you. <coughs> um, well, first of all, thank you very much to our officers. This is a, a really comprehensive report, uh, very, very thorough indeed. And it's clear that the applicants have uh, responded to some of the concerns raised and adapted some of the things that they're calling on. Um, as with so many of the applications we get at committee, this is one of those ones that has, you know, arguments in favour and arguments against. Clearly, that's our job, really, is to assess those. And it's difficult and interesting. There are arguments, very strong arguments, in favour of renewable energy, as we've heard. Everyone um, agrees that, I think. And then, of course, there are the arguments from particularly local people who would be impacted by this. Um, it's a difficult one, very difficult. But I think, for me, what is particularly concerning is the scale in this particular area, the cumulative impact of industrial development, because we already have significant uh, development in terms of polytunnels and things of that sort in this area. And as has been pointed out, it's not simply the panels themselves, it's all the infrastructure that goes with them, the, um, the uh, various um, fencing, um, substations, in best inverters, I think the term was, and so on. So it, it's really significant uh, impact. Question is, how do we deliver the renewable energy we need? And if we're going to say no to something like this, I think we need a much clearer idea of what we actually should be doing. And for me, what we need is some really sensible, well thought out regional or area plan that looks at all the potential in an area, doesn't just dump the occasional application on us, 
uh, expecting an answer. We need to look at the much broader picture, in my view, it's incredibly important. And there are other alternatives we could be looking at. Uh, uh, brownfield sites, um, over car parks, there's a whole range of other possibilities. But for me, I think it's the huge impact this is likely to have uh, on this scale and in this wonderful, beautiful area. Um, if this does go ahead, then I think there are some positive gains um, for this paths we've heard about, tree planting, ponds, landscaping and so on. I hope there'd be no tarmac, there is hardcore ways of developing the, uh, the um, access. Uh, the canal work we've heard about, will this is a potential opportunity for gain in doing the work needed to restore the canal. Um, maybe that could be added if this goes ahead. Um, I think that's probably nearly time out, but for me, it is too much in this area. So some regret, I have to say, I will be um, opposing it. Right. Councillor Watson, did you? Yeah, sorry. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, thank you, um, uh, Lusty. Um, yeah, it's, this one's a really tough one. I think that um, I take on board um, everything that Lusty has said in terms of um, you know the officer's report and the developer, um, the applicant's um, mitigations that have been put in place. It's a really tough one. I'm finding it very tough, and I'm looking forward to seeing, um, hearing what other people have got to say. Um, I think the other thing is that as individuals, we all have a responsibility in terms of renewable energy. And so when you're having solar farms, you know, it's, it's all in one spot. Um, we all need to use less, and, um, and we could all be putting our own solar panels on um, our own homes. For me, I have uh, four questions, um, Rebecca, if that's okay. Um, so it was raised by CPRE and having re read, and I apologize if I've missed it, is that what happens um, if the company goes bust? That's my first question. Um, you know, who oversees what happens to the field? And sorry about my naivety. Um, I take on board, are the panels non-reflective? You know, because um, I am aware about glint and glare, and you can actually see where I um, live, you can see the glint and glare of the polytunnels in my ward, um, you know, from the reflectors. So um, I see on the landscape plan that um, it's wild birds, <coughs> and it's actually amaranth, and I actually grow amaranth as a protein um, on our small holding, I and mean, it grows quite tall. Um, so I'm just wondering, how is the meadow going to actually be managed, um, mowed, and um, et cetera? Um, you know, I'm always, and I'm, I'm actually pro sheep grazing within, you know, solar farming because uh, but in terms of meadow conservation. So I'd be very interested to find out how you're going to deal with amaranth, which can actually grow to more than four feet. And what is the geology underneath <coughs> the um, the hydro? Um, I, I, I mention this because of the hum, because hum is not just um, um, above ground. A hum can also be through the ground. Um, so I'm just interested in about you know the geology underneath solar panels. Um, um, and I'm sorry that I wasn't able to attend the site visit yesterday because I think they're always valuable. Um, but I really do want um, want to um, express my thanks to the applicant for the mitigations put in and the work that you've done. Thank you. Councillor Rowe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, very thorough report about an, what I'm going to call an excellent application. Uh, colleagues, in March 2019, we declared a climate emergency. Uh, now, do we make that declaration? At the time I spoke and said it's it's not down to the council to do this, it was down to each individual person to do this. But I think I got heckled. We can't pick and choose what parts of dealing with a climate emergency we find acceptable. But these are our choices. Now, Felicity, sorry, C Councillor Norman said we should have a policy where we look at an area and decide where we want that. In all of Herefordshire, all 860 square miles of it is beautiful. Should we just have special industrial estates? Should we make sure every single building has uh, panels on? That's probably a good idea, but here and today, we're dealing with this. Um, 
These are our choices. So if not here, somewhere in Herefordshire, where? But we made that declaration. And what I find is quite difficult is, is that that was spurred on by a need and a desire. And we, we cannot say no to something that is full forced and head on taking that on. All of Herefordshire is beautiful. If you want to stick it down, by the words, that's fine. I, 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 I'm exacerbated, really, that we even sit and think that we can say no to this. It's a pity that we've got to even contemplate it, but we, we, we really cannot say no to this. Uh, one of my questions was going to be about the canal, but we've had that answered. Um, and then the other one I think I probably answered myself, which is it's condition 10. And it covers an archaeological dig on the Roman activity site in the middle. I'm just going to see if there's a volunteer. Can I go along with Jeremy and take part in that dig? But when it comes to here, if we're not going to put this site here, where, where are we going to put it in Herefordshire? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I, just, I would also remember, remind members that, uh, all members, that it's very, because I know someone in my area who to do something quite similar. It is very limited where this sort of um, uh, development could take place because it has to be close within a reasonable distance of the grid. Uh, and uh, this particular person who, I, who contacted me some time ago started down that road and discovered that they've got to pay <coughs> five or six million pounds in order to link up with the grid. So it's very limited to the amount of places where this can take place. Um, Councillor Shaw. Uh, th th thank you, Chair. Um, really, I suppose, echoing uh, Councillor Rhodes' comments, uh, the climate emergency is real and it's present. To approve this application will no doubt upset a lot of local people living in the area. But our responsibility is to act for the whole of Herefordshire and to consider the planning balance in this case very carefully. Um, I thank the officers and those who have spoken. Um, I cannot ignore the recommendations and evidence which have been given particularly by our landscaping and ecology officers. Um, and I think <laughs> if we're to refuse the application, we need to have some real evidence why why the officer's evidence is so badly flawed. And I can't see that. I'd like to understand the conditions um, being suggested a little better, specifically um, conditions 13 and 14. Condition 13 relates to the noise management plan. Um, and I appreciate that, that these uh, types of installations do have noise from, from various sources, from the from the inverters, about 120 hertz tonal noise, and then from any cooling fans, etc. Um, I'd like to see this condition enhanced, such that during and it's a big site, during the first two years of operation, this noise management plan ought to be reviewed. I think every three months, and I think that would both reassure the local population that we recognise that there could be a problem, we don't know, but that we, we will give um, ourselves the uh, powers to do something about it if, if it proves to be the case. Um, the other, um, which is a, perhaps a little less uh, concerning, but uh, concerning to me, um, I want to understand a little better uh, condition 14, um, the, these mammal gates or mammal uh, access. Um, there are some consideration to the fencing being a maximum uh, or a minimum of 10 by 10 centimetres square. Now, I know for hedgehogs, they need a 13 by 13 centimetres square to, to squeeze through. And it seems to me that um, we just don't want to to overlook that, that tiny um, issue um, relating to our hedgehogs. Um, but I, I, perhaps this mammal gates were, were, were what dealt with this issue. And I just wanted to ask the officer if that was the case. Thank you. <coughs> I can do what? Yes, yeah, so. If I just come back to um, your questions first, Councillor. 
Um, in terms of the CPRE, um, you asked about what happens um, if the company do go bust. So when we grant planning permission, the planning permission always goes with the land. So the landowner, it will become the landowner's responsibility. Um, you will note that there, there are conditions which, um, in terms of decommissioning, and the decommissioning, if if it stays for 30 years, um, it's, it's requested it comes in six months before the end. However, if the solar farm company did go bust and the solar farm was not active for a period of six months, that condition would kick in then, and it would be the landowner which would um, have that responsibility. Um, in answer to it being reflective, <coughs> yes, the panels are non-reflective. Um, and then there was, in terms of management and maintenance, um, there are, again, there's further conditions. Um, I think the management and maintenance was in connection with the landscape. Um, we have required, it's, it's standard now, I think, with all our planning applications at this scale, that we require the management and maintenance to be for 30 years anyway. Um, so if it would be for the lifetime of the development, they'll have that maintenance and management plan in place. Um, I think the other question you had was in regards to geology, was that correct? Um, I feel bad to say this as a minerals officer, but I know that the site isn't within a safeguarding area, so there's no hard rock underneath the site and there's no sand, sand and gravel. I would need to, to do some research to, to identify the exact mineral underneath. Certainly it wasn't because it's not within a safeguarding area and because of the nature of it, we haven't requested it um, as part of the application. Um, I take your point about noise um, and whether in that noise management plan we could um, uh, ask the applicant as, when they're submitting that noise management plan to consider the geology underneath and whether consideration needs to be given to the geology. Um, I'm happy to add that on. Yeah, um, be, could I ask that then, Chair, that um, if the application was to be approved, that we actually put that, um, yeah. you know, for the ge um, hydro hydro um, geology survey in. You know, for maintenance and monitoring, I think. And um, that's, that would be reason for, for noise? Yes. Yeah, so we could build it into the noise management. Yeah, I think that's looked at. Which builds on uh, Councillor Shaw's perspective. Yes, yeah, in terms of condition 13, which is the noise management, um, yes, I, think the, um, I, I agree with you, within the first two years, we could go every three months. I'm sure the applicant would be able to um, take that on board. Um, condition 14 regarding the mammals, again, Condition 14, um, it's, uh, the wording of it's a fairly standard condition which we use across sites and, and yes I'm sure in terms of the mammal, the mammal gates which have been proposed um, we can ensure that yeah, it includes all mammals. <coughs> Councillor Mill. Thank you Chair. My compliments also to the case officer for uh, what clearly represents a huge amount of work herself and the professional team at uh, Herbridge Council, going back many months, um, negotiating with the applicant to uh, <coughs> present us with a scheme uh, which uh, uh, takes on board to uh, um, as much as possible the concerns of, of residents and uh, the environmental concerns, for example, about uh, uh, the use of uh, uh, quality agricultural land. So I, 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 I'm uh, 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 very much of the view that uh, uh, solo energy is the future and that we do need to be support, supporting these sorts of schemes, although um, I recognise that there is a cumulative impact effect, having granted the one at Dormington not to, uh, consent this committee did last year. Uh, and yes, as Councillor Rohn said, it would be nice if uh, these 45,000 panels were on the roofs of all the industrial units at uh, Rotherworth rather than within our glorious countryside. But uh, we, um, we are, as has been pointed out, in climate emergency and uh, compromises do need to be made. Um, I do uh, take particular issue, uh, however, with um, one aspect, and that is at 4.9 of the officer's report, where we have a report on biodiversity net gain. Um, and there is a sort of certain amount of pseudoscience and greenwash appears here, which uh, I find a little alarming, a comment like the proposed development will result in a net gain in biodiversity units of 134.39%. 
in habitat units and 61.9 in hedgerow units. Well, I mean, that, that is pretty pseudoscience, really, and, and very much suffers from this uh, um, problem that uh, scientists have of, of shifting baseline syndrome. Because, of course, if you ask old Fred, the 80-year-old the countryman, who's known the sight man and boy, what his baseline would be. But, but because he first became uh, familiar with it, perhaps in the 1950s, before the recent collapse in, uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, the depletion in um, uh, uh, wildlife in our countryside, his baseline will be completely different. Um, and indeed, he will be dead right, because I've done a bit of um, map regression research before this meeting, and you can see just how many hedgerows and trees have been grubbed out in recent years across this landscape. So um, I think we just need to be a bit cautious when we're trying to sell a scheme on concepts like biodiversity net game and coming up with, uh, uh, frankly, pretty unverifiable figures like that. I mean, I do not deny that efforts are being made, and I appreciate those to mitigate the impacts, but whether they result necessarily in biodiversity. Okay, thank okay. you, Chair. Thank I have you. said sufficient. Can I now ask mm. Councillor Polly Andrews? <coughs> thank you, Chair. Excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold. Um, you have mentioned my late husband's connection with the Harriman across the Canal Society. Can I assure everybody I have no connection with it at the present moment, but I do understand all their works are in the Gloucester end, not the Harriman end at the present time. Um, I won't repeat what everybody else has said, but I would just note that there are no objections from the statutory consultees, consul sorry, I'm having trouble with my voice. There are no objections from the statutory Council team, including the landscape officer, and I just wonder where that would lead us if um, this is refused as it goes to appeal. Thank you. Councillor Milmore. Yes, um, climate emergency has been brought up in this debate on a number of occasions, and, um, and I, I, for one, believe that Herefordshire should not be flagellating itself over climate emergency because climate emergency is going to be decided in the Far East. It's not going to be decided in Hereford or in this country at all. We have no impact on it whatsoever. So my question is, um, do, do we know where these solar pa panels are going to be manufactured? Are they going to be manufactured in China with sweatshop labor um, from uh, powered by coal power fire stations? So do we, do we have an answer to that question? I, I don't think that in planning terms is relevant, um, but uh, does anyone think? <coughs> the simple answer is no, I, I, can't, I can't say where the panels are going to come from. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. <coughs> well, I, I just think that we should not be flagellating ourselves in this county over climate emergency. Yeah. Right, I've had uh, all the speakers, I think. Sorry, I need propositions. Council Shaw. Uh, can I propose that the um, application is approved, subject to any changes in the conditions that the committee have outlined? Is that, is that seconded? That the conditions will... Oh, Condition... 13 or 14, was it? 13 and 14. 13, 13 specifically. Sorry, can I just ask, Councillor Shaw, you did mention about a, a very short periodic check on the emissions. That was the change. 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 Okay, now, um, officers, Mr. Withers, on. <coughs> um, thank you, Chairman. I don't think I've got too much to add. I think uh, councillors have clearly grappled with you know, a, a difficult balance um, in terms of uh, assessing the, 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 the climate um, agenda um, aspects of the application against um, what are clearly um, well put concerns uh, from, from local residents. Um, it's been said, 
Um, the report doesn't identify any formal objections amongst any of our internal consultees or, or statutory consultees. Uh, and so I don't think I need to say much more. I, I, I'm satisfied that the committee have fully understood what that balance is and will make a um, decision uh, on, on that basis. Right. Now I'll go to the um, local members. Councillor Andrews first and then Councillor. Yeah. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Committee, for the debate. Um, I'm glad Councillor Shaw has brought um, can, um, item, well, Condition 13, uh, that's one of the things the uh, West Hyde would most importantly go on about, actually, about the noise, and actually, could we alter that? So I, I do welcome if the Committee's going to approve this application that is actually put in. There's a few other things I'd like to say as well. Um, obviously, the red line of the development is larger than what is going to be proposed. <coughs> the West Hyde re re residents would like, if at all possible, if there could be anything legally binding, that, that this cannot be extended. Now, I don't know if that could happen, um, but obviously at the moment, it's not, and I understand you have to have a separate application if it's done, but if there could be anything done, the West Side residents would like that. Um, the developer to be required to install low noise inverters with additional acoustic baffles to mitigate the noise impact on local residents. Substation if it, to be surrounded with a mud wall insulated to resolve some of the noise. The applicant must provide specific spe specifications of the inverters and baffles to be used for the agreement to agreed max dB output to ensure dwelling background noise does not exceed accepted current background noise of 23 decibels. Requirement for preventive maintenance schedule on inverter substation to ensure they stay at the agreed decibel for the life of the installation to be actively monitored and managed by Hereford Council. Obviously, we just said number 13. Um, process for immediate remedial action if it's demonstrated by the local authority or specialist sound professional that breach has occurred. Regarding flooding, if buns and this is required on field F, buns installed to capture water instead of discharge into the water course, or a further pond on this field, or the use of canal. Landscaping, use of mature trees, well, that's been demonstrated anyway, but if that can actually happen, and hedgerows to provide a screening before 15 years. Planning condition 14, additional mammal gates. Could there be even more mammal gates installed every 20 metres? Currently only 21 across the hundreds of metres of fencing. They feel that's an inadequate, and so do I. Very few bird boxes, bat boxes, and ensure gates are sized for deer, because there is deer in this area. Actually there yesterday. Impact assessment on connection route, the methodology prior to the commencement to be signed off by the LA. Obviously, community benefit is not a planning matter. But I know that the applicant with the parish council will hopefully do something like that. Encourage the developer to formalise the community benefit, but if possible, strict working hours to Monday to Friday, 9am to 5pm, to reduce the impact of the development to the residents. If those could be looked at and Read, gentlemen, do you want to? Um, yeah, no, certainly in terms of condition 13, um, I think a lot of what you were talking about would probably fall into the noise management anyway, um, certainly in terms of conditions. Yeah. Um, if you wanted to, I haven't managed to note everything that you said. No, no, down, I'll, I'll, I'll provide know, it. Yeah, if you wanted to provide that to me, we could yeah. ensure that in, we, could, uh, we could adapt the wording of condition, but ensure that when that condition comes to be discharged, um, we can make sure that those, um, as far as possible, that they are in, are, they are in there. Thank you. Um, a lot of what you discussed was mitigation should 
should a noise impact be discovered, um, we, could, we could build in further mitigation. In terms of condition 14, yes, we can, uh, we can um, ask or request for more mammal gates um, and we can discuss the deal with them also. Um, you mentioned about the site boundary. The site, site boundary has remained the same. Um, largely because that was the application site when it was submitted. So when you amend an, an application site or, or amend a proposal, you don't amend the application site. Um, there are conditions that under condition two, um, it, the development will be in accordance with the approved plans. Um, so any further development will have to be subject to another planning application, um, which matters will be just, um, uh, considered then. We couldn't put a legal agreement in place at, at no time should any development take place um, and uh, if the applicant was successful and built outside the application site that would then be in breach of planning condition so then that would have its own consequences for that thank you Phil. appreciate it. right councillor lester yes thank you chairman uh i i listened uh with great interest to my colleagues uh mulling over the merits or the concerns and issues in the application. But I have to confess that I'm, I'm concerned that not enough debate and concern has been put on the impact of the landscape, uh, which, which this development will have on the landscape. And in, in answer to uh, Councillor Andrews' point, Polly Andrews, I should say, uh, point uh, about what an appeal inspector would say, um, well, I quoted what an appeal inspector would say at length, and it was highlighting that only a 10 hectare size would have a demonstrable and negative impact on the landscape. And this is twice the size of that. So irrespective of all the other issues that uh, this proposal uh, will have on the environment and uh, the people of West Hyde and Oakle Pitchard, um, the, the, the impact of the landscape will be significant. And I just do not think there's been sufficient weight or assessment of the fact that this will have real harmful effects over a long period of time um uh, I, I note the that 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 uh councillor paul andrews has put a whole host of other conditions that he would like to see on there and if it's going to get approved i would support that so i understand that officers will debate that later on but I, I have to stress that uh you know this will have a massive impact on the environment uh and, and the locality and the residents and and i think there are clear reasons why this particular application in this location should not be supported thank you mr withers do you want uh, very very quickly uh chairman i just wanted to ensure and make clear to the committee that um although i can completely understand why inferences are being made uh, to other other application sites that had different outcomes the committee is here to assess this application on its individual merits and, and as such please don't be swayed by uh, the determination of an application elsewhere in the county or, or indeed the appeal outcome in that case this is very much an assessment of this site on its individual merits right we have a motion in front of us which is to protect the officer's recommendation as outlined in the in the um, agenda so I'm subject to one or two slight amendments and, and proposing certain further conditions. Can I ask that those in favour please indicate? Those against? I'm sorry, I couldn't see behind. I'm sorry, I didn't find that. Okay, and that is carried by uh, 10 votes to three. Can I now, thank you all. Can I ask that the live stream is um, turned off, that we have a 10 minute. Thank you. I welcome you back to the meeting following our adjournment. I request that the public speakers present in person for agenda item 10 join the meeting. <coughs> Mr. Ben Bennett, Marvin Parish Council, Ms. Seema, local objector, and Mr. Powell, the applicant, take their seat in the public tables.
Good morning and welcome you to the meeting. We'll call you to speak following the officer's presentation on the application. Can I now ask uh, Emily Brooks to make her presentation for this particular item, which is an agricultural building adjacent to Barrington Bower, Marden, Herefordshire. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll just wait for the slides to, to appear. <coughs> Fabulous, thank you. So thank you, Chairman, again, and thank you to those members who attended the site visit yesterday. I hope that it was useful to a certain extent. Um, the site in question today is located within the hamlet of Litmarsh, which is approximately one and three quarter miles north of Marden. Um, as such today, the proposal is assessed against the adopted Herefordshire Development Plan, which is made up of the Herefordshire Core Strategy and the Marden Neighbourhood Development Plan. The National Planning Policy Framework is a material consideration. May I also take this time to um, reference to the update sheets. There are a couple of conditions that have been requested further. Um, one relates to um, the blind window on the northeastern side elevation. Um, the condition requests that this blind window remains blind um, for, forever. Um, and also a condition to ensure that the building remains, um, is only to be used as a holiday let. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the application before you today is for the conversion of an agricultural building into a one bedroom holiday let. No external changes are proposed, um, so the building as it stands today would not be externally changed. Um, the, there are some changes that are seeking um, regularization, which is namely the two roof lights that you see on the um, on the northwestern roof slope and the insertion of a flue um, which which is the northeastern gable elevation which you can see in the photographs uh, at the bottom photographs you can see that that gable end there um, so the top photograph shows um, the building as it stood during the um, enforcement application and um, I won't go into detail again this is this has been um, detailed quite um, quite thoroughly in the officer's report at section 3 and also paragraph 6.6 .6 to 6.9 of the officer's report the balcony has been removed um, and the flue has been moved from the southern gable end to the northern gable end um, it's also worth noting that you can see in these photographs that there is one downward facing light above the entrance. Um, there's also a downward facing light on an outbuilding. Next slide, please. Um, on this slide, you can see the site layout. So this is as it stands today. Um, on here, um, you can see that the, the access driveway and parking area is to be utilized. Um, the council's area engineer has been consulted and raises no objection, um, expressing that there is acceptable visibility and acceptable uh, provision um, of space for the parking and turning of vehicles. Um, this slide also highlights the proximity between the application site, which is titled Barrington Bower in the, in the slide, um, and to the neighbouring property, which is the square box, which is titled Barrington Cottage. Um, so that's to the southeast of the application building. The distance between these two buildings is approximately four metres. The entire boundary that you see is um, highly vegetated with quite tall and dense vegetation, um, which a lot of you would have seen on the site visit yesterday. Um, there are no windows on the southern gable um, and no windows um, proposed on the northeast elevation. Um, there are two roof lights on that elevation, however, they have been sealed internally and a condition is recommended that those roof lights are completely removed and that the roof is made good to alleviate, um, to ensure that there is no form of overlooking um, from those two elevations. A condition is also recommended to restrict the insertion of any windows um, 
and also the removal of any permitted development rights. Um, there are windows on the north west and north elevation, however these overlook into um, the owner of the land that is within the ownership of the applicant. And the building itself is not extended to what it is today and therefore um, it is considered that there is no overbearing or overshadowing experienced um, or that is exacerbated by virtue of this application. Um, the environmental, our, the council's environmental health officer has been consulted um, with regards to the flu um, and the impact that that would have upon the neighbouring property and also with regards to the potential noise um, by virtue of the, the building being converted for use as a holiday let. They raise no objections and they recommend um, some conditions to restrict noise, um, which is included within the officer's report. Um, next slide, please. Um, the building is located within flood zone one um, and there is no further hard standing proposed. Um, as such, there is no surface water risks identified at the site. The existing surface water system utilises a woodland rainwater garden, which is within the, the blue line that you see in the plan. Um, and this garden provides sufficient attenuation volume, um, and as such, there's no objection from our land drainage specialists. Um, the proposal seeks to connect to an existing septic tank which has capacity for five people, which is therefore um, more than sufficient to accommodate the flows from a one bedroom holiday let. Um, all of the relevant testing has been carried out and, and shows acceptable drainage rates. Um, the information supplied also indicates that there are no pathways for any nutrients on, into the river lug, um, specifically phosphates, um, <coughs> and as such screened out of the HRA process. Um, no objections from ecology or land drainage have been raised. Um, so to summarise, the proposal would itself um, result in a sustainable reuse of an existing attractive <coughs> rural building um, which supports the local economy and the county's tourism offering. Uh, offering. The building is visually contained uh, through the screening of vegetation and therefore that limits the impact upon the, the wider landscape. No harm has been identified with regards to the immunity of the surrounding neighbours and specific, specifically noting some of the conditions that have been requested and our consultee comments. Um, it's not considered that the insertion of a flue and two roof lights would harm the character and appearance of the building to such an extent that a refusal is warranted in this instance, particularly when you weigh up the benefits that arise through tourism and, and economy. Um, the foul and surface water drainage strategy is accepted and confirmed as um, our ecology and land drainage specialists. No other technical objection has been received from any consultee and therefore it is my recommendation that the application is approved subject to the conditions outlined within the officer's report. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I can't see facing the presentation. I couldn't see. Right, can I now ask for the speakers, um, those that are uh, going to speak, uh, Mr. Bennett on behalf of um, Barden Parish Council. Thank you. Parish Council requests that this committee refuse the application as it forms a development in the countryside. In the Parish Council's opinion, it does not satisfy the criteria required to meet core strategy policies RA56 and E4 and M3, M10, M11 as the Martin Neighbourhood Development Plan. In addition, the Parish Council believes this committee has not been apprised of the full history behind this application and the associated prior decisions made. <coughs> planning Officer's report begins with the failed enforcement bill, but there were four planning applications prior to this notice. In 1985 and 1986, similar to the current application to provide holiday accommodation, in 1998 to provide a cottage and garage, and in 2001, accommodation for associated additional, uh, sorry, adjacent horticultural facilities. All refused, even the last one, for essentially the same reasons. Firstly, the proposed development is an open countryside being outside the endorsed Hamlet settlement boundary and does not meet 
the limited areas of exemption, particularly when dealing with a conservation of a historic and or architecturally interesting building. Secondly, conversion in close proximity to a property in separate ownership would be detrimental to the privacy, environment and living conditions of the occupants of that nearby dwelling. And thirdly, the proposal would result in an undesirable consolidation of the existing sporadic development in an area and would adversely affect the landscape quality of the area designated as being of great landscape value. Now, while national and local plans may change over time, it is difficult to see any reason why the current application differs from those made in 85 and 86. Since the 2001 refusal, the property has undergone residential type changes of enough significance to bring about an enforcement notice and subsequent failed appeal process. It is of real concern to the Parish Council that the recommendations made by the appointed inspector were not enforced by Herbertshire Council in full. If they had been, then the committee would be able to compare the original barn more accurately with the proposed development rather than something that has already approaches a converted residential property. The current application would appear to be the last throw of the dice using tourism again, again to justify the conversion. Parish Council encourages this committee to refuse this application and request that enforcement notice be implemented in full. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Can I now invite Mr. Seema to, to uh, a local resident to speak in objection to the planning application? Thank you. I represent the other contiguous neighbour and many local parishes. We oppose this new proposal. Our concerns are to the pollution of Barrington Lakes, effect on the aquatic biodiversity, landscape and continued contentious planning out of the NDP, and disagree that this is a sustainable development of any true sustainable tourist or economic value. Planning permission in 2001 was refused. Conversions went ahead, a septic tank and roof lights, balcony and wood burning they were installed. Enforcement notices were issued. In the applicant appealed but lost in 2019. All external added features were to be removed, but the enforcement notice has never been fully enforced and these are still in situ. Planning rules have not changed to date. But this new proposal is not sustainable. The environment has already been damaged. Nothing is offered to mitigate by way of enhancement. If tourist accommodation were granted, the increased use and the human activity would massively increase the negative impacts. The site is an area of great landscape value and the love catchment, with local draining ditches within 10 metres and feeding directly into Barrington Lakes. The development is reliant on a septic tank and associated drainage field installed before current flowering to legislation. Of course, tourist accommodation will hugely increase its use, and there has been no residential use of the barn previously. A modern compliant pumped mound system or reed bed should be installed to protect water quality and the sensitive local aquatic <coughs> ecosystems. There will be an accumulative discharge effect as there are other new developments by the side of this draining into the same waterways. The barn does not provide sustainable heating method. There are no solar panels. As this is a new proposal, surely it should conform to new regulations and a modern water learner installed. But since the flue is still covered by enforcement, surely electric heating or a ground or air source heat pump be installed instead. Tourist accommodation would result in increased use of the wood burner, but not necessarily efficiently, causing more noxious low lying smoke. It is an area of dark skies, roof lights cause a vertical light spill. Tourist use would necessitate more frequent and intense lighting, as well as the need for external lighting and headlights shining directly into my cottage on arrival. This is not sustainable tourism by way of above. It generates increased traffic as the site is only accessible by car. There is no provision for an electric charge point. There are no local cycle routes. All tourist sites and amenities require travel by car. Management by the applicant would create additional journeys. It is not existing rural business to diversify. No employment will be generated, nor will there be any true economic gain. Any benefit will be greatly outweighed by the negative impacts. 
the applicant does not live on site and is not impacted by the effect of visitors. I bought Barrington Cottage 25 years ago because there was no immediate neighbours. My amenities by way of noise nuisance, light and air quality are directly affected by the barn's use. I'm afraid I'm going to ask you to sum up quickly, please. The balcony, which you have noted at the site visit, is still under enforcement and overlooks the whole of my garden and my privacy is lost. There is no privacy concealment by the, the use of the shrubs. It's why you pay in the toilet. Sorry, I'm going to have to stop you. We have to observe the, the rules. Um, thank you. And now I ask that uh, Mr. Powell, the applicant, to speak in support of the application. You have three minutes. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. Um, first, a quick one. Um, the site visit yesterday, uh, unfortunately, my agent and I didn't have any prior notice of it. <coughs> I was, first I heard of it, I was the other side of Hereford. And being the only key holder, there was no way for uh, and could be opened up in time for the visit. I would have welcomed the site visit, so it's, that's an unfortunate occurrence. My application is for the creation of a holiday let through the conversion of a stone barn at Littmarsh Marden. <clears throat> I came to live in Littmarsh in 1953 and purchased the land and building in 1983 when employed in the nearby family fruit farm. It had previously been a cow share, but I used it variously as a to shed, workshop, apple store, apple grading shed, pick your own fruit weighing point, rest room, pack house for nursery stock and for general storage. Electricity and mains wards were connected during this time. We also provided seasonal employment for many villagers over the years. By 2012, the building had fallen into a state of disrepair. I had ceased commercial fruit growing, but had retained the barn and attached land and took the opportunity to refurbish it so that it might provide a place of rest for me when I'd been working in the accompanying field. The refurbishment included replacing the roof, rewiring, installation of toilets and general redecoration. The building was never lived in, but because of the type and extent of refurbishment taken, the council took the view of it that it constituted a dwelling so there was an enforcement notice on the building. My appeal was unsuccessful, an application of it to be used as a dwelling was refused because some of the works carried out in the building were considered to be harmful to its character. The enforcement notice required the removal of the balcony, the flue, some roof lights, as well as prohibiting the use of the building as a dwelling, which it never had been used as a. I complied with the enforcement notice to the council's satisfaction. The roof lights, balcony and flue were removed, and there has been no residential use. The building has been used for storage and for occasionally resting after working the land. Subsequently, I decided to explore the opportunity for using the building as a holiday land. So I sought the council's pre application advice via their pay for service. The proposal included none of the elements which the council had previously considered to be unacceptable and instead proposed a far more sensitive conversion of the building. Council agreed and issued a positive pre application advice. Following receipt of that advice, this application was submitted seeking plan permission for the conversion of the building to holiday let. The proposal does not require any new building works, it simply requires the change of use of the building to holiday let and so in the I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to st stop now. We've gone over the three minutes. Uh, uh, just one more thing the intention is to limit occupation to two adults. No children, right. no pets. Thank you. All right. If you could now take your places back in the public gallery. <coughs> the local ma member is Councillor Gem Gemma Keema, sorry, Keema Guthrie. Um, as she has sent her apologies for the meeting, but has provided a written statement. Please, can this be read to the meeting? I'd like to thank the case officer for her report and all the members of the committee who were able to attend the site meeting held on Tuesday. Indeed, I would like to relay 
My apologies to my constituents, committee members and the chairman, as unfortunately I was not able to attend the site visit or be present today due to the very short notice given prior to this meeting. Consequently, I am unavailable due to other commitments. However, I am very grateful for the, to the chairman for allowing me to submit a written statement. Regarding the site visit, I think it was very important for members to view the settings and surroundings of this site as it is located in a particularly rural area. It is in the parish of Marden and within the small hamlet of Lipmarsh, adjacent to the C1120, which is a narrow country lane. The roads and infrastructure around Lipmarsh are in a poor condition, regularly subjected to large agricultural traffic and heavy goods vehicles, which members might have encountered en route along the C1120. Key points that I would like to draw members' attention to are as follows. Planning history. 3.1.3.2 of the officer report details two previous planning applications on this site which have been refused with the reason being the principle of development in this location is unacceptable in open countryside, unsustainable and not an <coughs> exception. There have been many representations of objection from concerned residents living in the area because this application is retrospective and has been subject to enforcement action and a subsequent appeal which was dismissed. The site is outside the Marden Neighbourhood Development Plan. 6.4 of the Officer Report. The MNDP does not contain any relevant policies relating to the provision of tourist accommodation. However, it is noted that the site lies outside of the Lipmarsh settlement boundary as defined by the MNDP. Therefore, given the location of the site outside of the designated settlement for growth, it falls to be assessed against the relevant policies of the development plan which pertain to the open countryside. Surely more weight should be given to the fact that the site location is outside the development plan than a principle of small-scale tourism. 6.5 of the officer report. The accommodation could be offered for short-term occupancy by families, walkers and cyclists, permitting access to the quiet roads and public rights of way found in the surrounding area. Ideally, this rural location should be accessed by quiet roads, but the reality is that the roads are not quiet. They are very busy and potentially set to get busier. Read concerns of cumulative impact of housing and large agricultural applications in this area. I know that members will be advised by officers to only take into account the planning application being discussed, but I think it is very important that you are all aware of the cumulative impact of new housing and potential further developments on Lipmarsh. In Lipmarsh, there is a new housing development being built for five houses close to this site. There is currently a live planning application for a large house to the west of Barrington Cottage. In addition, just half a mile away in the small hamlets of Erdemarsh and the Wall, <coughs> there is a large scale planning application for polytunnels subject to a redirection request. This application will be considered by a future planning committee. I strongly appeal to members of this committee to duly give much weight to the Marden NDP and to the many public representations who raise concern over the following issues. Highways, increased traffic and difficult access on a dangerous bend. The small network of roads around Marden and Lipmarsh are in a bad state of repair, repeatedly being subject to numerous heavy goods vehicles and speeding traffic. The C1120 is a narrow road and not many places for two-way traffic. It is already too busy with lorries to and from the local water factory, as well as large agricultural traffic and other HGV traffic. Often highways problems are exacerbated due to the road frequently being used as a rep run when the A49 Dimmore Hill is closed from the A417 junction. The C1120 road goes over a very steep hill known locally as the God Almighty. Unfortunately, there have been regular incidents with HGVs getting stuck and blocking the road. Flooding in Lipmarsh. Localised flooding is already a major problem in the area. Water runoff flows down from the hill surrounding the entrances to nearby properties and ultimately pooling at the bottom of the hill at the junction to the vault near to Barrington Cottage and Barrington Bower. The drain on the road to the vault is often blocked and therefore makes the local flooding problem at this location much worse. Lit marsh refers to a marshy area and the ground is naturally boggy and wet. Pollution and drainage. Many of the objectors highlight drainage concern. An extract from one representation reads as follows. Certain SUDS facilities will not be effective because the operation of such systems 
will be compromised when the water table is close to the surface for most of the year. There will not be sufficient attenuation storage capacity available underground to mitigate against surface water flood risks. <coughs> Other concerns which have been highlighted include <coughs> flooding of the drainage ditch that runs near the barn, causing the barn septic tank to overflow. The effluent could potentially flow into the local waterways. Many residents have suffered with their septic tanks flooding in times of prolonged rainy conditions. This would have an adverse effect on the local ecology and increase the phosphate levels in groundwater and ultimately reach Barrington Lake, Hodnan Lakes Nature Reserve and the River Lug, which is a designated SSSI and SAC. This would have potential to increase the already high phosphate levels, which are causing eutrophication and a possible peak in algae blooms. 6.10 Officer Report Amenity. Although the proximity between the buildings is close, just under four metres, there is a well vegetated boundary established between the buildings. The point here to focus on is that Barrington Cottage is very close to the barn, just under four metres in distance. Therefore, surely this will have a negative impact on the overall amenity of Barrington Cottage, potentially being subject to noise nuisance from holiday makers and light pollution. External lighting causing pollution. Officers report, protected species and dark sky references what might be acceptable lighting at this location. However, surely more lighting, whatever intensity, will have a negative impact on protected species, the dark night skies, and impacts on the amenity of Barrington Cottage. Tourism. Local residents are very concerned that the tourism aspects of this application and consider that this holiday-let development will do nothing to encourage sustainable tourism as it is in an, in an area with no frequent bus service and on a busy narrow lane where walkers, cyclists and horse riders are at risk from speeding traffic with no roadside footpath available, making this site unsustainable. Marden Parish Council comments. Resolve to object. One, the requirements of the appeal decision made 13th of March 2019 by Elizabeth Jones, an inspector appointed by the Secretary of State, have not been implemented in full. Two, a wastewater and drainage strategy with details including foul water percolation tests, location of drainage field and association, associated sizing have not been submitted. Also required are the results of infiltration testing undertaken in accordance with BRE365, a confirmation of groundwater levels to demonstrate that the invert level of any soakways or unlined attenuation features can be located a minimum of one metre above groundwater levels in accordance with the standing advice. Three, all of the construction work to date has been done without any formal planning permission. Four, all works are outside the requirements of the NDP, M2, M3, M12 and M14 dark skies. Five, an ecological survey has not been supplied. I would like to urge members to refuse this application on the following grounds. In summary, the proposal is retrospective as a history of enforcement action. Importantly, the site is situated outside the Marden Neighbourhood Development Plan as it, and is in open countryside contrary to policy M1. The proposal is unsustainable with regard to the drainage system, risk of flooding and pollution to the nearby lake and river lug. The need for the use of vehicles due to the lack of public transport also makes the proposal unsustainable, having an overall negative impact on the rural environment. Concerns have been raised about the potential harm to the amenity of adjacent Barrington Cottage, Barrington Cottage referencing light pollution, noise, nuisance and likely pollution emanating from the septic tank drainage system. The proposal is contrary to core strategy policies RA2, RA3, RA5, RA6, LD1, LD2, SD1, SD3 and E4. The proposal is contrary to the Marden Neighbourhood Development Plan policies M1, M2, M3, M12 and M14. The proposal is contrary to the National Planning Policy Framework, Paris 8 and 11. There have been many local representations of objection to this planning application. Please listen to the local community with Marden Parish Council, uphold the Marden Neighbourhood Development Plan and refuse this planning application. Thank you. I know it's managing to get through that. Can I now in, invite debate? 
Councillor Watson. Yeah, I might all kick off. Thanks. Um, I'm always really disappointed to receive retrospective planning applications as a ward councillor. I think that, um, and I just wanted to ask is that my understanding is that when there is notification of a planning committee and a planning site visit, everyone who has made a representation gets notification. And I'm assuming that's the same with the agent and the applicant. Yes, I, I have a confession to make, if I can just come to that point. Um, my understanding, forgive me, I haven't sat in this position for a while, but my understanding was that uh, uh, other members of the team contacted the uh, applicant uh, to make the site visit arrangements. I've learned something uh, that won't happen again in the future. <coughs> so unfortunately, councils weren't able to actually get onto the applicant's property, but were able to view the application from the neighbour's property, which is quite an important um, part of the assessment, I think, in terms of that amenity consideration. So, yes, all, all residents who have objected were notified. Okay, right, thank you. Um, can I just continue with my... Um, so thanks for that, thanks, um, Mr Withers. Um, I think that the other problem with retrospective applications is that my understanding as a newly elected member four years ago is that they don't need to do a preliminary ec ecological assessment and they don't need to do a drainage survey as part, you know, but if it was at the pre app stage, they would, you know, so if they were going for a, an application, whereas <coughs> with retrospective planning, you don't. Um, and it's really just clarification on that. I couldn't see any rankings <coughs> of harvesting in the application. And um, and that's and I'm wondering where the cycle provision is going to be to encourage you know sustainable travel. Um, I take on board all the um, objections that have been expressed by the community. I think that um, from me looking on the outside, it's unfortunate I couldn't go to the site visit yesterday, but it's a case of try, try, and try again. So, and with the applicant then doing works, which is then not being properly enforced, puts us in a very difficult situation. Um, I must admit, I, it's a one bedroom holiday let, um, and um, in terms of balance, but I think that um, it, it's just really, it, it just makes me feel very unease, uneasy about what's been going on, and um, and I, I can't see. Um, I think for me, I would have no roof lights. I would take away all and put it back to its original form. If ventilation is a problem, there's dampness, you know, in the in the property, and I think that there's an opportunity for air source heat pump. Or mechanical ventilation, heat recovery systems. You don't need to open up windows. And I think that if, if this was going to be approved, I would say that it needs to go completely back. No roof lights, no external lighting. If tourists wants to come, then they have to use a torch or use their mobile phone torches. Um, because I just think that it can go. For, no roof lights whatsoever. As, and I must admit is that I feel quite strongly about it. If it's dark skies, it has to be dark skies. And that means putting the roof back to normal, back to how it was. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Orson. Can I just remind members that the law changed a number of years ago um, that we must not consider the retrospective element of this particular application. I mean, it goes back to Mrs. Thatcher. <coughs> And if we are using that as, um, or we are prejudiced by that, then uh, it's, it's an unlawful decision. So, I members of that, be careful what you actually say as regards that. <coughs> Councillor Shaw, however difficult it may be. <coughs> thank, thank, thank you, Chair. I, was, uh, I didn't realise I was, I was next. Um, I welcome, uh, uh, thank you for the report. Um, which I thought was, was well presented. Um, I welcome the further condition, uh, which seem, uh, seeks to mitigate some, some concerns raised in um, relation to the holiday let. 
Um, members will be uh, perhaps familiar that holiday lets fall in class C3 of the Uses Classes Order 1987 and are thus dwelling houses, albeit that their occupation is restricted rather like agricultural dwellings. So the use of a per holiday let as a permanent dwelling cannot be a change of use to a dwelling house as the original use is already a dwelling house. So any unauthorised occupation of the dwelling is not subject to the four-year rule, but uh, it's the breach of the holiday occupancy of the condition and the 10-year limit applies. Now that might uh, uh, assuage some concerns that a new separate dwelling was being created in, in terms of a, a, a separate uh, ongoing um, uh, property in the countryside. Um, I have um, a question in relation to the condition and it relates to um, what, how, how the authority is thinking of enforcing that condition. So I'd like um, to hear, um, finished, uh, how, how the authority intends to enforce. The other concern I have um, relates really to um, what my, my colleague, Councillor Watson, referred to when she was speaking. Um, and the information therefore supplied with this application. Normally we would see plans before and after a, uh, a, a conversion to a dwelling. Um, and up to my mind, the plans here were, were sparse at least. Um, I think the applicant, according to her advisor, obtained planning consent, but it wasn't clear to me whether this was for the building or for the failed drainage system. Um, and um, the building is surrounded on two sides by a large, extremely large shadowy hedge. Since the date of the conversion, two Velux windows have been effectively removed. And we have a responsibility as local planning authorities, we're expected to exercise our planning judgment when considering, considering a detailed floor plan of conversions and there are assessments of adequate light in habitable rooms. Now, I could only see some very small windows apart from those Velux lights. The doors are solid and then shut, um, there's no light through those. So without such detailed drawings, I don't see how we can fulfill the function of deciding whether the light in the habitable rooms is adequate. I have a concern that we would be authorizing a substandard C3 dwelling if we uh, made our decision without that information. And I recognise the dwellings being visited by planning enforcement, but only in respect of the appeal matters. So the um, building um, also has a, a wood burning stove in the room. Councillor Shaw, sure. I've Sorry. gone over the three oh, minutes. I beg, beg your pardon then. Thank you. Councillor Bowie. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. I wonder, was Councillor Shaw moving towards a deferral of this until we get further information and perhaps some clarification on the enforcement notices and whether they have been suitably um, implemented or should there be more of that? Uh, it is all fact puzzling, really. Uh, and I do think that we need to think about. If we're talking about the, the drainage, uh, a wetland with um, Willows and reed beds would be perhaps helpful as well. And what are the alternatives for this building? Are we going to get a get a letter? Good, rather nice little stone barn all into total disrepair and rot. I rather hope not. Seems a, a waste of a good building. And this this old hoary chestnut of a new house in open countryside. Well, technically perhaps yes, but it is in fact right next door to another house. And therefore, it is not exactly open countryside in that way either. I would feel. But it's, it's difficult. You could also ask for a charging point to be installed if the application is approved. That's not a problem, I think. And I suggest that outsourced <coughs> heating is always best when allied to uh, underfloor heating. Uh, definitely makes a difference. So there are certain matters there, and perhaps you ought to. I can perhaps take on the role of asking for a deferral until further um, information. And thank you to our planning officer for uh, who works on this matter, and we much appreciate that. And it's very interesting seeing it. And also to the neighbour who let us go onto our land as well. Um, could I <coughs> suggest a deferral? 
Can I, can I just before um, we deal with that, can I just ask the officers, well, either of you, to Well, yes, respond? I mean, um, I don't think there are any specific questions raised, but I think I just wanted to stress uh, a couple of points, really. Um, the condition of the building is effectively post enforcement. Okay, we have taken enforcement action and they have basically adapted the building back to what we would consider. And I've heard the comments that others don't believe that that is acceptable, but a decision has been made by this council that the actions that they took to comply with that enforcement notice are acceptable. Um, and so the condition of the building as you see it is what it is and we're being asked to consider its conversion we're not being asked to consider a new dwelling in the open countryside so i think you can you can i'm not saying set aside but i think you need to be careful when you're considering the comments that have been made about development outside of the settlement boundary within the modern neighborhood development plan there are exceptions made for the conversion of suitable buildings for alternative purposes and, and this is one of those exceptions the conversion for holiday accommodation. So I wanted to make those points very clear. I also wanted to just perhaps reinforce the point, the condition of the building as we find it now, i.e. post enforcement, is what we have to assess in terms of the level of information we need to consider the impact on habitats, on protected species and the drainage characteristics of the site. All, all of that has been tested quite rigorously by Alpha BTR drainage specialists and our economy and so on that basis whilst i understand there have been comments made about the paucity of some of the information the fact is that in this particular case that information was not required in order to assess the impacts so i just wanted to be clear on that point before any decision is made on where we so, take the application mr withers we can be sure that all planning all planning enforcement has been finished and dealt with now and is not no longer relevant well, not not quite. Oh. Um, Can we have the, 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 as is as is set out in the report, one of the requirements of the enforcement notice was to remove roof lights, and, and those roof lights have not been completely re re removed. They've been effectively encased uh, within that existing roof. There's a condition recommended on this application that those are completely removed. So, so that would, from my point of view, deal with that outstanding enforcement matter. And that might apply to the window at, at the ground floor of the house at the back. Uh, condition, uh, uh, yes, a condition is recommended to ensure that that, that relationship is protected too. Councillor Bowman. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I, it was interesting going there and having a look, and I certainly understand where the neighbours are coming from. It clearly is going to make a difference to them. However, careful. The applicant is it's, it's it's bound to make that difference so i understand their concern about that um thank you officers for the report itself and for this clarification that we've just had about what has been dealt with and what hasn't um i i i, I take the point made by uh, one of my colleagues what is going to happen to this building um i don't think any of us want to see it fall down and you know problems that might cause and, and the loss of a fairly solid sound building. So to some extent, I'm in sympathy with the idea of holiday let, um, but it's how that's done, you know, the care that's taken. Um, I would suggest it, it needs to have renewable energy, rainwater harvesting, all the things we've already heard of. Also, when we look at the travel, the impact of further transport on this network, um, how many car places does it need? I think it says three, does it? Have I got that right? Why? I would suggest one, and I would certainly make the point made that it that there is a plug-in for encouraging, at the very least, an electric car. So I think there's a lot that could be done to reduce the impact um, in, in various ways, which I would very much like to see as part of this proposal. Um, but I'm uneasy about completely refusing it because Something does need to happen to this building, in my view. I, 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 and this person is the best. Added to which, we know there is a massive shortage of, of um, tourist, uh, tourist um, accommodation in the county. So it would be helpful in that sense. So still thinking and listening, but that's sort of the way I'm going at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Andrews and then Councillor Davies. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. 
I must say I felt the site visit was extremely interesting. It did bring home the proximity of the barn uh, to the next door cottage. There really, is. But there is, as we all noted, a very substantial hedge and fencing dividing the two properties. Um, a holiday let of one bedroom. I think holiday lets of that nature do tend to attract perhaps older couples who want a quiet, peaceful holiday. You don't go. You, you wouldn't go to Litmarsh if you wanted a quick, kiss me quick type holiday, would you? <laughs> and, and, and could I point out that we actually saw the bus service. In fact, Councillor Davis had to move her car to allow the bus to go past. So there actually is a bus service there, which is quite unusual, I think, in that area. But I feel that we should, this is a local tourist thing. We should support it. And I can't see what else we're going to do with the barn otherwise. So I will move the recommendation for approval. I was just going to say, um, I do have um, some history with, with holiday lets, and we have never had 52 weeks of the year fully occupied. <coughs> so if we are looking for any form of restric restrictions on this, <coughs> if we're going to pass it, maybe to say for nine months of the year, but put something like that in place. Um, and what well, the comments has already been made, I would hate to say that lovely stone barn fall down. I think that I uh, agree with my colleagues that you know, I'd rather see it being um, hardly let than fall down. So, Jeff, so, so, if you're looking for a restriction on time, it's usually conventional for one month to make sure there's not total not totally taken over by one family, one person, or you want to be able to turn it to a different yeah. sort of uh, residence. Uh, yeah, I, I can perhaps make a comment on that. I think um, I understand the rationale for wanting to um, contain or, or control um, activities um, these related, but uh, what I would say uh, is that ultimately what's being proposed isn't an inherently noisy activity. You know, it, it's about people it's about people's behaviour, not, not about the actual nature of the use that's being proposed itself. So it's, it's more of a management issue than it is about restricting when people can be there. We, 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 we recommended some, oh, I think, are reasonable restrictions about outdoor activities, amplified music outdoor, where no, no fire pits and, and, and things like that. Those are reasonable and I think very enforceable. But I think to say that to make the development acceptable, it wouldn't be occupied for one month of the year. I don't think it actually deals with the issue that you're concerned about. Um, you know, it could be really, really noisy for 11 months of the year. Um, it's a, it comes back to a management issue. It, it comes back to people's behaviour when they're staying, not whether or not there's one month in the year when nobody's there. So I just urge caution. I think we can restrict the occupancy to holiday accommodation, retain that level of control. We have some controls around outdoor activities and light and so on. It's all perfectly reasonable, but if it's the committee's wish, then we'll go down that route. But I just, I'm not sure it's reasonable in, in, in terms of the tests that we would apply. Can I say, it, it, it's almost unknown for it to be 52 weeks of the year let. I mean, we do very well if you get 80%, I think. Generally, um, Councillor Watson, do you want to come back and then Councillor Robert and then Councillor Bell? Yeah, um, my point is that um, I know that there's cycle parking within your condition, which is great, but um, there's nothing about rainwater harvesting, you know, which is again about reducing the stormwater into uh, the septic tank and things like that. I really do really look at so thinking about that. And the other thing is around people's behaviour and ventilation, having overseen. Um, self-catering and um, holiday lets for many years is that um, a lot of people don't like opening windows when they're having you know showers baths and it can get rather moldy what are the planning implications around ventilation um, i'm not mindful to promote air source heat pumps because they can actually be quite noisy and with it being quite close to the uh, the, the, the neighboring property um, in the terms of balances that would burning stove would be better 
Um, but it's really about the ventilation system because um, for me, I'm thinking about an EPC and um, it's about what can be done within the building um, to minimise uh, ventilation like a humidifier. But I don't know what about planning, it's about behaviour again, sorry. Um, I was just going to say that that would be a building control matter. Okay. Um, and with regards to the roof lights that you were mentioning earlier, um, those could be used for ventilation. But as your, your concern was, was that primarily due to lighting? Um, yes. What, what I have seen on other applications, and obviously that's something that would need to be um, considered. Um, I dealt with one recently in the Malvern Hills area about selling natural beauty, and a film was laid over roof lights to restrict light spill into um, the area. So that could be an option moving forward as well. Um, as you mentioned also, so I'm going back to your original questions. Um, the site vision you just noticed that was that was in, in the um, uh, conditions recommended. Land drainage wise, you mentioned about rainwater harvesting. Um, it's something that we could potentially consider to be a condition, but if you look at the um, the detail outlined within our Bath BC land drainage consultation response, they have um, noted that there is a woodland rainwater garden to the north, um, which provides an attenuated volume of 224 meter cubed, um, which is adequate for the proposed development. So um, from that perspective, it's acceptable to accommodate any surface water runoff, um, but we could potentially think about attaching a condition for rain water butts um, if that's something that you'd like to, to mm. see. Yeah, I think it's just good practice. I think that every house, you know, should be looking at rainwater harvesting, especially with the river wide situation and, and storm overflow. I think, yeah, you just need to get in, you know. The same, same with the right recondition on the um, charge point for an electric vehicle. That, yeah. that could be a, a preoccupation condition that somebody has installed pre prior to it. Right. That's absolutely that. Councillor yeah. Probert. Uh, yes, just to ask, and so can we confirm that this building will be limited to short term holiday lets and that if any change in that happens, it will be subject to further application? Uh, okay, yeah. yes, so it would be restricted to holiday let purposes only. And so, if they, it was ever to be become used as a dwelling, our enforcement team would have to investigate and, um, and, and further application would have to be assessed, uh, like Rebecca's application we were talking about earlier. Um, that would be then open to the assessment during that application um, and the condition would restrict its use. And the concern there's three parking spaces where the applicant said there's only going to be two adults staying in them. Why do we need three parking spaces? Um, the reason for that is because that is the hard standing as it is there now. Um, there has been no alterations to what is existing. Um, it's not, we wouldn't, yeah. Councillor Mill. <coughs> Uh, comments and a query from me. First, first of all, the comment. The comment simply to uh, support uh, what uh, Councillor Davis's su suggestion uh, that um, uh, there, there's a, a time limit, limit put on the <coughs> uh, on the use of the use of the building. And I say that really because, as a stone barn with probably uh, not the same levels of uh, um, insulation and energy efficiency that. Uh, that, that a permanent residence would have, that uh, it could be quite a, a gloomy, um, hard to heat kind of a place in February. And we really do have a responsibility and let, uh, to try and encourage um, low energy use in, in, in buildings, whatever their use. So uh, that there is a, a good uh, climate change reason for supporting that uh, suggestion of Councillor Davis is, in my opinion, the um, query is of uh, the um, ecologist report, who um, initially objected strongly to this uh, proposal, um, as any of us instinctively would, as the foul is to a um, is is to a septic tank, um, and clearly. Uh, it is difficult to demonstrate compliance with the HRA under SD4, SD3, SS1, SS3, and LD2, as uh, as is pointed out. Um, and then uh, there is this um, 
assurance that the septic tank is supported by a drainage field. Um, and just uh, towards the bottom of page 76, uh, the end of the penultimate paragraph, it says, the septic tank is confirmed as discharging to an existing drainage field size to accommodate all poetical flows from the size of the septic tank installed. I love this notion of uh, your foul uh, discharging poetically. Um, and I just wonder what that word should be. Is it practical or is it... Uh, um, is it potential? Potential. What is it? I'm going to go with potential. You're going to go with potential. Okay. Right. Well, thank you. I that clarifies that. <laughs> Rather disappointing, though. No. <laughs> and I believe our planning officer is a poet as well. So <laughs> just right. Well, I could thought of a poetic discharge. <laughs> <laughs> about planning conditions in future. <laughs> thank you. I'm oh, Council Shaw. Can, can I just come back, um, Chair? Um, I'm, I'm still keen to hear how the authority is preparing to enforce the holiday let condition, unless it is simply going to rely on someone saying to the planning enforcement, oh, I think someone's living, living there full time. Um, is there no proactivity at all by the authority to enforce the condition that it's imposing? Um, and the second is to suggest an additional condition if the um, committee is going to approve. Um, I still am very concerned that I have no sight of this building being fit for human habitation. And i um, just wondering if there can be a condition that before occupation that a uh, building's completion certificate is provided to the authority um, uh, to give uh, confidence that the uh, building is suitable for human habitation. Um, the application date, um, whenever it is, should be the date um, which applies to all the building control regulations relating to that building. Um, it's not our issue that the building was converted at an earlier date. So the date of building control is the date of the application for a dwelling. Thank you. Um, I'll, in terms of the condition, um, <coughs> how, how we can control that, we have a condition that requires a, effectively a register of occupiers. Yep. And um, that that's limited to, normally it's a two or three week stay and we can have, we can see a record of people coming and going and recognize that as a holiday use so that that's 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 that point dealt with um, I'm struggling a little bit with the um, uh, human habitation point um, we don't have specific policies um, that require a certain standards to be met it is normally speaking a building control point and is regulated through the building regulations it would be at that point where issues might be identified and if it's outside the scope of what we're, we might be approving today, then they may need to come back and amend that permission, uh, change what we may approve today in order to achieve building regulations approval. So, so I, I, I'm, I can't answer the question, if I'm being honest, I can't say to you that it's what the standard of accommodation is. All I can say is that we don't have a policy and it will be for the future occupiers you know, they're holiday makers, not saying that they shouldn't enjoy a reasonable standard of accommodation. It's a bit of a different situation to a dwelling in my, in my view. Um, the other option is for us to go away and um, discuss that with our building control team and establish beyond doubt that they are happy with the level of accommodation that's being proposed. And if we can manufacture a sort of a delegated authority situation through a decision made here today to do that, then that would be uh, potentially a way forward. Mr. Chair, Chair, I'd be happy with that. Okay. All right, I've got no one else indicating to speak. <coughs> um, uh, do you want any comment? I don't think I need to add further to the discussion that's been had. I just want to ensure that I've captured 
the relevant uh, considerations that have been added as the debate has, has gone on. Taking last first, I think if, if the move is, is, is not to approve today, but to allow us to review that position, then we'll go away and do that. We can certainly add conditions relating to the treatment of the retained uh, roof lights. We can certainly add conditions relating to the provision of rainwater for harvesting to uh, complement um, the other um, aspects of the drainage strategy that have been presented. And we can certainly require um, the uh, provision of a uh, charging point for a vehicle. Um, and obviously, the condition related to the, the nature in which we restrict occupancy will be a, as well. So I think, I think I've caught, caught everyone's points there. And on that basis, I'm happy that um, the committee yep. can move forward. Move forward. Um, has Councillor Guthrie got any final comments? Or? She does, yes. Or a uh, statement. Five minutes time limit. Final summary statement, Councillor Guthrie. Many thanks, members, for the debate and consideration of all aspects regarding this planning application. Material planning reasons why I consider it should be refused, and in my view, this proposed is contrary to core strategy policies. RA 2.3 The development does not result in a high quality, sustainable, appropriate scheme and does not make a positive contribution to the surrounding environment and its landscape setting. RA 3.4. This application does not result in the sustainable reuse of a redundant or disused building and does not lead to an enhancement, enhancement of its immediate setting. RA 5. The design proposals do not respect the character and significance of this stone barn located in this very rural and isolated environment, with no public transport to the site, encouraging the use of more vehicles in this area. RA6, the proposal does not promote sustainable tourism and may have an unacceptable adverse impact on the amenity of nearby residents, in particular regarding noise and lighting. LD1, the proposal does not protect and enhance the setting of the lip marsh, nor does it conserve and enhance the natural and historic scenic beauty of important landscapes and features, the nearby wildlife lake and the river lug, triple SI and SAC. LD2, biodiversity and geodiversity development proposals do not conserve, restore and enhance the biodiversity <coughs> and geodiversity assets of Herefordshire. SD1, the proposal is not a sustainable design and does not safeguard the residential amenity for existing and proposed residents. The development might potentially cause adverse impacts arising from noise, light and groundwater pollution. SD3, many local concerns have been raised about the water management not being sustainable, and there are fears that this problem may lead to higher flood and pollution risk, especially to the river like Triple SI and SAC. E4, representations have been made about this site as being unsuitable for tourism, and that a holiday let will not conserve and enhance the county's unique environment <coughs> and heritage assets. Contrary to policy M1, as the site is outside the settlement boundary, proposals for new housing development will only be permitted within the settlement boundary or on allocated <coughs> sites as shown on the Marden Village policies. <coughs> I think it is very important to carefully consider the Marden Development Neighbourhood Development Plan objectives. It is my opinion that the following objectives are not being met by this planning application. Objective 2 to ensure that housing development in the surrounding hamlets of Lip Marsh, Burr Marsh, The Vault, and other hamlets is managed appropriately. Objective seven, to ensure that the natural and built environment of the parish is protected and enhanced for future generations through sustainable development by protecting key environmental and heritage assets, e.g. green spaces and landscapes, natural environment designations, and taking account of constraints. Policy M2, scale and type of housing development in designated hamlets. It is not within the agreed testament boundary as shown on the policy map. It is not of a high quality of design or in keeping with the environment and rural landscape. Given its location, it may have significant effects on the local lake and catchment area. Pollution and drainage. Policy M11, the site is too close to watercourse and lake, potential negative impact from sewage, 
runoff contamination from treater M11. In my op opinion, this planning application fails to meet the National Planning Policy Framework guidelines, in particular the following. Paragraph 8, Achieving Sustainable Development. C, an environmental objective to protect and enhance our natural built and historic environment, including making effective use and improving biodiversity using natural resources prudently, minimising waste and pollution and mitigating and adapting to climate change, including moving to a low carbon economy. Paragraph 11. Plans and decisions should apply a presumption in favour of sustainable development. All plans should promote a sustainable pattern of development that seeks to meet the development needs of their area, align growth and infrastructure, improve the environment, mitigate climate change. I would like to reiterate that there have been many local representations in objections to this planning application. Please listen to the local community with Marden Parish Council, uphold the Marden Neighbourhood Development Plan and refuse this planning application. Thank you. Um, no further comments. We have a proposer and a seconder for, um, with certain added um, conditions. Councillor Shaw, do you want to? Could I just clarify that there is an added condition that the approval is subject to a physical inspection by the authorities, building control officer, with any issues that he raises, addresses, addressed before <coughs> commences? Or is that not a condition? That can be applied. I thought that was, that was explicit in the, any planning. It can't. It can't be a condition. It's right. it's it's a, a condition that's requiring compliance with regulations that aren't planning regulations. So so it's not a reasonable condition. I think my suggestion was, and I don't want to delay the determination of the application. That if that was critical, then the the, the approach would be to defer and possibly delegate authority to approve subject to officers going away and checking that point with building control. Thank so you. that's, that's so different from the solution that's on the So that's a different resolution to the one that's on the table. Yes. It would be a different resolution to delegate the authority to people. Thank you. Right. We have a proposer, seconder for the application as outlined and on several additions, additional conditions. Can I ask for those in favour, please, sir? Those against? Those abstained? None? Then that is carried. Can I now move on fairly quickly to item 8? works. Um, can I ask the uh, officers, uh, Mr. Rolls, to make a presentation? Thank you, Chair. The speaker perhaps could take their place. Could I ask that everybody speaks up a little bit? Yeah, because everybody seems to be getting quiet. I wonder why. <laughs> getting hungry. Staying away. Well, we got the presentation. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah. Well, we <laughs> Thank 
you um, apologise if I put this in advance. I can the cold over night, so I might not be able to speak that loudly. Um, this application seeks full planning permission. Sorry, can we just wait till you get a uh, the microphone? Like 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 <laughs> 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 as long as you don't think uh, think Delilah. <laughs> Yep, that's it. Okay, so this application seeks full planning permission. It relates to site lining in the countryside within the parish of Solstone at the southern end of a linear woodland planted on Markle Ridge. This application is indicated by the red star on the plan for you. Uh, the application is reported to the committee following a redirection request from the board member. Proposal is for the erection of an agricultural workers' dwelling, including a detached double garage and for associated works. Accommodation is provided over two floors and contain three bedrooms. Just in terms of um, updates, if there was any, there was any one, um, I should direct members to a correction to paragraph 1.1 of my report. Uh, this was due to an issue with uh, feet and metres, so it read as, as if it was 870 metres to the south west of the site. Um, that's, that is the distance to the to the farmstead, when in fact it's around 250 metres as the crow flies. Uh, if we can move on to the second slide, please. Okay, uh, so the site area is edged in red. Uh, in terms of constraints, I should point out the site falls within an area designated as ancient replanted woodland and a, a local wildlife as, as a local wildlife site as well. That being the woodlands along Markle Ridge. Uh, Markle Hill and um, Ridge Hill. The aerial photograph at the bottom shows a small clearing within the woodland that is proposed to accommodate development, as well as the access from the east along a single track carriageway known as Lindell's Lane. It's, it's also relevant to point out the presence of the Y Valley A and B boundary, uh, some 200, sorry, 730 metres to the southwest of the site at its closest point. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the uh, existing site plan, uh, which shows that any notable tree constraints lie along site boundaries. An existing field gate allows access to the southeastern corner, uh, and a public right of way runs along the eastern boundary, uh, leading along the route of existing and historical woodland. What you can also pick up from this plan is, is the steep topography, sloping down from the north to the southwest corner. It's approximately a 19 metre difference in elevation. At the very top of the site is 194 metres AOD, um, which obviously reflects its elevated position in the rural landscape. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, this is the proposed site layout with an access driveway to be formed by cutting into the slope. Uh, the proposed dwelling would be brought the L shape and platform with a detached bar garage building sitting alongside. A uh, driveway with land and parking in terms of two cars and a patio car standing in the to Western Park site. I should also point out the proximity of the retaining wall around the garage um, to the RPAs of the two mature trees to be retained along that boundary. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please? So this shows the Proposed drainage layout, um, including a new package treatment plant with linear drainage field to be used for uh, outfall of treated effluent. This is a 13 metre long channel uh, which would progressively encroach on the RPA of a small leaf lime tree in the southeastern corner of the site. Um, two surface water soakways are also proposed one to serve the house and one to serve the garage. Next slide, please. Okay, I won't go to dwell too long on this. This, this is the proposed floor plans. Uh, master bedroom is shown around the floor with two further bedrooms at the floor. Uh, as officers, we haven't taken issue with the amount of accommodation sought, uh, but it not being disproportionate to a, a farm worker's dwelling. Next slide, please. Okay, these are the proposed elevations for the house, uh, reflecting two story design, including external cladding and timber stone under a slate roof. Again, we've not taken issue with the amended design per se, uh, 
rather it's the location of dwelling relative to the farmstead that is in contention. Next slide please. Okay, so this is the garage elevations and floor plan. Um, just a couple of points on that. Given, it, given it's shown as a single storey building, it is quite generously proportioned in terms of headroom. It's a 5.8 metre ridge height. Um, this is probably a consequence of the large retaining wall structure behind it, cutting into the slope. So if you look on the right hand side of that front elevation, that retaining wall there measures 2.95 metres tall, which I believe is probably that for influence the slightly raised view height. Uh, the other point is solar panels are uh, shown to the roof slope, which would be the primary source of electricity. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so the, these are all, the next three slides are all photographs taken from the applicant's landscape and visual appraisal. Um, obviously, I've, I've, I've selected the, the, the locations where the, the impact is more evident um, for obvious reasons to highlight the isolated skyline position of the proposed development. So this first one is the view from Foxhall Rattle Hill looking north. We, uh, obviously you can see the mast in the background there. Um, go on to the next slide please. So this one is the view from the road looking north towards the site from the entrance to West North End Farm. And then finally, this one, this is the view from Crossing Hand, Russell Hill, looking northeast towards the site. Okay, next slide, please. So, so I've included this slide just, just but in terms of reference in case members have any questions where the, the views were taken from. Um, the three that I've selected the most southerly viewpoints on that plan. So, I hope you can all make those points. Uh, the key also helpfully plots public footpaths, including the one running along the eastern side boundary that I've already mentioned. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a photograph I took myself uh, mid August last year uh, when the application was submitted. The trees were obviously in leaf uh, and stood towards the centre of the city, looking out to the wider land. Uh, I've included this just to illustrate the commanding permission that position of the site and the greater degree of landscape and visual sensitivity arises from choosing to build in this location. Um, I should point out that um, obviously one of the concerns in the report um, is the potential for light. So again, in a, in, a, in a rural area near to an A and B, they were trying to maintain dark skies. You could obviously impose a condition in that respect, but it wouldn't mitigate all all light emissions, both externally and internally. Next slide, please. Okay, so I've included these 3D visuals, which might help you to sort of um, envisage the development. Uh, I believe the local member might wish to refer to these in more detail. Um, just to conclude then, uh, we are recommending refusal as, uh, as planning officers, whilst recognising the, the significant contribution of farming and farmers to the rural economy and rural communities. Um, in this case, um, the recommendation is for refusal. We're not seeking to resist the development of a carefully sited new farm dwelling per se that, that, that would meet the agricultural needs identified. However, for the reasons set out in the report, we cannot support the current proposal in that elevated position. Thank you. Thank you. And now can I ask Mr. Rogers, I think, yeah, to uh, make the presentation. Um, <clears throat> thank you for taking the time to consider my application. After 28 years of living at Foxhall's Farm, and with a baby on the way, it was decided that I'd overstate my tenure under my parents' roof. Working on the family farm, the priority was to find somewhere to live nearby so that I could continue to be on hand 24-7. But with astronomical local property prices, our hope of purchasing a home was not feasible. With that in mind, along with a positive agricultural appraisal, which determined a significant need for a secondary dwelling, it was decided we would look to build on, her, on land surrounding the farmyard. As a farming family who have managed and nurtured this land for well over a century, <clears throat> we took time in choosing the location that, with a clear view of the farm, that would result in the least amount of highly versatile agricultural land being lost. The generations of experience informed the decision to focus on a parcel just to the north of the farm, 
The field is small with little depth of the soil, so it does not provide much grazing, even for a tiny flock of sheep. It's also awkward for efficient use with modern farming equipment. However, for a home, the little field has many benefits. There are views overlooking the farm, the farm drive, and the grazing meadows around it. There's an existing access track to the site. The farm can be accessed by foot in less than three minutes, and the south-facing topography of the site lends itself well to self-sufficiency with solar renewable energy. With a site in mind, professional advice was sought. The site was surveyed by planning, ecological, arboricultural and drainage professionals who found no reason against the suitability of the site for a modest dwelling. <coughs> Following the receipt of comments from consultees, uh, we would accept conditions to reposition the carport 1.4 metres south so that it falls outside of the defined root protection area. The external materials have already been changed to a more sympathetic design, which now consists of stone and timber cladding. Other concerns related to middle and long distance views from the south. As addressed within the LVIA, these views are only experienced by a small number of receptors and for a short period of time. And any views of the proposed property would fall below the ridge line and be experienced within the existing vegetation and against the broadcasting tower, which dominates the ridge line. Additional planting would further integrate the property into its surroundings while significantly increasing the number of wildflowers, hedgerows and trees on the site. As documented within the officer's report, the majority of the factors considered have been overwhelmingly positive. This includes no objections from Natural England, Minerals and Waste, Public Rights Away, Ecology, Land Drainage and Highways. The application was unanimously supported by the Parish Council, who deemed that the application fully complied with their neighbourhood development plan. The application also wholeheartedly supported by members of the community, local area and public rights away users, as shown by the positive correspondence. Myself and my young family are in, in an incredibly difficult position, and we implore the members to approve the application. Thank you. Thank you. The local member is Campbell Durkin, and I ask him, we've got 10 minutes. Yes, come on. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, if you could go back to the. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for all those that came to my wonderful ward yesterday. I'm sure it was well worth it for the views that it's it up. Um, this is an application for the continuity of farm in a progression term from the existing farmer down to the next generation. And the application is not now for need of a house to be accepted, but for its location. I contend that it satisfies CS policy uh, H2, um, RA3, RA2, elements of, and RA4, and then the landscape, LD1. The appointment of external agricultural planning was to review the application, but I cannot find in the report the agenda back. It seemed to me that the application was reasonably supported by concerns about the travel to the farm and that 6.5 of this agenda, whilst noting the scale of the, the essential work carried out, the supervisory capacity needed night and day, reservations were expressed regarding the functional need for a second dwelling, over and above the purpose of the existing farmhouse. 5.01 of the External Agriculture Plans Report says that it's regarding the functional needs, the access to the farm. The proposed site would not be considered ideal as it would need to get the vehicle to get to the building. Now you've heard that it is 250 metres downhill and directly looking down, if you if you look yesterday, you see you're directly looking down on the full farm itself. And that any new development should be laid closely to the activities where there is a need, and there is. The the report then went on to give a convoluted route along the highway for a car to meet Foxhall's farm. And all you need to do is walk 250 metres, or in an emergency, use a quad bike uh, to go down the 250 metres through, through an existing gate. I can attest to this because I did it twice last week. Scary? Yes. <laughs> um, the sighting to a question asked yesterday about electrical supply. It is designed that electrical need will be preserved by PV panels with colour gas for the other. A dwelling's position will be set out just forward of the location you saw yesterday, so as not to damage the tree, tree root floor. It will be dug down into the ground by two metres, and that 
picture you saw a little while ago of the view to the south, um, you need to be two metres lower. So we get the true perspective of when this is being dug into the ground. The landscape officer reflects about the MN10 March Markle public right of way. And he said there's no landscape scene that need to great the built form and new York proper uh, new use appropriately into the surroundings. I disagree. This plan is extensively amended by the RP to provide a more agricultural view to the proposed one. Looking like a farm that does not provide and does provide a rustic view, enhancing the landscape for those needing accommodation. Which I wouldn't feel it was sure was settle into the landscape. I must admit when I first saw the initial drawings it was rather a a stark realisation, but the looking into an agricultural type building, I think, does soften it somewhat. At 4.9, the rights away manager has no objection, and it's the intention of the applicant to infill the public right away edge to establish better non visibility. I was engineer, you heard from the applicant, no objection. Significant public trans uh, public support and express for the proposal, as summarised by some 21 points in the report. The parish council fully support it unanimously, and it also is permitted within the NDP. Origin Commission does not object, but provides comment. In response to the landscape concerns, the major commission the landscape and visual appraisal, and this is relatively positive with regard to the uh, the effect of the house in the landscape. In conclusion, at new dwellings. New dwellings to lie in close proximity to the existing built form of a farm and makes use of shared infrastructure such as access roads. The situation of the built form for the farm is only 250 metres away, as you heard from the planning officer today as an amendment, and immediately is accessible by farm vehicles and not by the convoluted route considered appropriate by the external plan reviewer. When first proposed, the house did make a statement in the landscape and it was rather bold. However, the following discussion and consideration, the final slide, I may go back to the final slide here, um, shows that the um, is a, it's built of an agricultural style and view from middle to long distances will be seen in the plot as an environment surrounded by trees and that's blending in with the landscape and farm building prevalent in the area and visible in a medium and long term from the proposed house. Finally, if I could see the next photograph, please, uh, the one I took. We talk about, uh, in, in the report, that was consistent with existing structures in the wider landscape. That's uh, so another photograph. So there's one more. Yeah. There's one more. Uh, that's it. This is one I took. This is round about where you um, park your vehicles, and it is higher by some degree than the location of the dwelling site. And that's much Markle Ridge. That is the height of much Markle Ridge. And then um, the proposed development is below the height of much Markle Ridge. But look at that. There's a mast which is predominant. And look at the white buildings, very utilitarian, providing nothing for the landscape of much Markle Ridge, I would suggest, but been allowed to be there for years. Now what we're looking at here is a proposal for a an agricultural style looking building house on a piece of land which is surrounded by trees and would fit, in my opinion, quite nicely into the landscape from medium, long and short views. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. And now I open the debate. Can I have some speakers? Councillor Bowen. Thank you, Mr Chairman. And thank you for the planning officer for giving us the opportunity to see such a lovely bit of countryside and a very interesting proposal as well. And thank you for your introduction, etc. cetera. Um, yes, I think this is quite evenly balanced because it is very prominent in the countryside and you can see it from a very long way away from one side of Markle Ridge, not from the other. It's not right in the very top, of course. Um, it's not quite as handy as it could be for the farm, I'd have thought, quite. <coughs> It's preferable to have it a bit nearer your cattle, etc. Uh, and a lot of excavation will be needed to be done. And I think you need to be pretty fit to get there and back in three minutes. Perhaps they are, yes, yes, he's got rugby for that property. Um, so, yeah. Uh, 
it's a, it's a, it's, I think it's a very, very difficult decision, this really. But we thoroughly endorse, I believe, most of us, the principle of another dwelling for this young couple with their young, very young child and the, the long prospect of being very much involved in the farm. And that's admirable, I believe, and very appropriate in this setting as well. Is this house in the right place? Is it too visible or going to be too visible? Is it appropriately sighted? above all, I think, really. Um, well, I think we need to think about that a lot. And is it, <clears throat> well, we've noticed down a very rough track at the moment, a real Yeti track, uh, if you know what a Yeti is. Uh, and certainly, emergency vehicles might find it a bit of a problem getting there, I think, which is one, one of my concerns. Um, I hope that will never occur, but you have to be aware of that. And it is definitely a new house in open countryside, if ever there was one. Um, I'm going to listen to the rest of the debate and see where my decision will lie. Thank you. Councillor Norman. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, thank you to officers for the report. Um, it really was a site that you had to visit to get the real, to, re to really understand what it is we're talking about. Pictures do not do it justice. Um, I completely accept the need for an agricultural dwelling and I wish the family well. Clearly they are well thought of in the community, lots of support for this and I would support it too. What I wouldn't support is this particular site. Um, it seems to me that for all sorts of reasons this is going to be extremely visible in the landscape. Um, it's going to have all the problems that, would, that, that leads to intrusion into the landscape, uh, light, um, pollution, a whole range of things, which you can do a certain amount about, but only a very limited amount. Um, what isn't clear is, although we're told about 250 metres or whatever it was, it's very, very steep down to the farm. Now, you might whiz down there, whether on your feet or in a vehicle, but you wouldn't whiz back up. It's very steep indeed and quite rocky and, and, and rough. Um, I, I, if, if there's going to be a dwelling, it really needs to be on the farm site itself, in my view, partly to minimise the intrusion into the countryside and partly to make it more accessible and more um, <clears throat> useful in terms of the work involved on the farm. Um, so for lots of reasons, uh, we've heard about the Herefordshire Trail going very far, going past that site. Um, it would impact on visitors, tourism, walkers, so on and so on. It's unsustainable, no services there. You could do a small amount about that solar panels and so on, but uh, otherwise you'd be having to bring up services. So I'm afraid for me, uh, while I support the principle, the idea of a dwelling, this is not the right site for it. Thank you, Councillor Lord. I just, I <coughs> say, I'm, I'm very grateful it's not near my, near me, because I'd have to explain why we forced some of my neighbours to, to have dwellings close to their, <coughs> their farms. Councillor Watson. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, I think Felicity's actually just said everything that I wanted to as well and, and what's been inferred. It's a very difficult application and I truly come from, um, you know, supporting a young couple, supporting a local farming business. But for me, it doesn't blend with the landscape. It's a, it's, it's a, a good house, but I support officers' recommendation uh, for refusal. Councillor Andrews. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Chairman. I think the site visit was extremely interesting. Uh, it emphasised the, um, the difficulty of the site itself. It's on a slope, and even the access for construction vehicles would be very difficult. But I look at 6.17, the Landscape Office has concluded that this location is not suitable for residential development. And having seen the site, I can only agree with him. I have every sympathy with the young couple, but please, surely there must be a better site lower down, nearer the farm buildings. And like Councillor Norman and Councillor Watson, I agree with the officer's recommendation, and I'm happy to move. Well, I'm not happy, but I will remove um, move that officer's recommendation for refusal is uh, considered. Is that, is that second to Yeah. Um, Councillor Hardwick, sorry. Right. Quite disappointed I didn't get in before that. Okay. Um, Can't hear you, John. Sorry? 
can't hear what he says. I said I'm disappointed that I don't, didn't get in before that motion was put. But oh, okay. um, I've got to disagree to uh, and support um, the ward councillor on this um, in respect that um, when we were on the site visit, uh, when we moved from the site onto the next application, uh, we drove along the Markle Ridge and you would have witnessed as you drove along that ridge individual properties all along on Markle Ridge so it is quite normal then to have individual properties on Markle Ridge um, it's got a lot of local support local parish council um, the NDP actually supports it as well um, so I personally think that it would have been uh, good to recommend this. Uh, it's, it's a family farm uh, that's uh, been farmed by three generations, uh, long-standing members of the community. Um, all the neighbours seem to be supporting it. Um, personally, I don't see anything wrong with it. Thank you. Councillor Rowan. Uh, I, I, I find it hard when we're dealing with young people in their futures that we should be sitting and a lot of us represent wards that are in towns and cities city and we're deciding what's suitable and how they're going to get up and down that 250 meters um, if the applicants believe that's where it should be then that's where it should be I, I can completely understand and reading the officer's report that it is possibly too far away um, how it's going to affect the visuals I don't know I, get me wrong but isn't there a 250 300 foot post standing up in the air there I know that's not a dwelling but it certainly takes your eye off the line and then what Councillor Hardwick said I wasn't able to go there yesterday Councillor Hardwick just said you're, you're looking at number of properties all the way along there if, if there's a need for an agricultural uh, residence and the people who are going to pay to build this the family who are going to live there uh, have identified it then we, we've got to have a really good reason to say no uh, I, i'm afraid i always bounce back to thinking of if they've been there for best part of three generations that little person who's bounced around on mum's lap over there they also want to stay in this business as we all know for anybody under the age of 40 at the moment you try and buy a house unless nan and granddad have passed away and bunging you an awful lot of money it is a huge struggle uh, is it in the right place well i'm going to leave that judgment to the family and i'm sure they took advice before they put the application in, if that's where they think it is, and I'm going to support the local member, and I'm going to go against uh, the planning officer's advice, and uh, I, I, I really think that we should take them at face value and support this application. Councillor Davis. Um, yes. Um, on the site yesterday, I thought it was a fantastic place to build a house. Actually, if I had a choice, that's where I'd put mine. Um, I have, I've listened to all the arguments about how, how steep it is and whatever, but are we thinking about our age group? Are we thinking about the younger age group? Um, I really feel that as that field cannot be used for anything else, um, what is the point of, of wanting to situate it in another field that is of value, an agricultural place? So I support um, both councillors and uh, the local councillor. Right. Um, are there any other speakers? I've got no one listed. Okay. Our opposite, so. <coughs> just, just to come back on a few of the points, <coughs> of, um, just to reiterate again that we're not we're not saying the applicant can't have a, a, a farmhouse here, um, but we need to have that further discussion. As we to can't get you ready. I'm afraid you need your microphone. Okay, so just saying that uh, we're not saying that this is a full stop. 
that we, we won't commit to the farm running here. We, we, we as officers have taken a very pragmatic view as to the agricultural needs arising in terms of the advice we received from our consultant. Um, in, in many respects, we've overridden that to, to take a positive and proactive approach to it. What we've said to the applicant all along is this is not the site to build upon. Um, if I just read out the um, reason justification to policy RA4, so it says where the need for a dwelling is established on the basis of a proven essential need, preference should be given to the use of suitable existing buildings through conversion. Where this is not possible, any new development should relate closely to the activities for which there is a need. In most cases, this would mean the new dwelling should be sited in close proximity to existing buildings, isolated locations or locations that could encourage farm fragmentation in the case of dwellings for farm enterprises should be avoided. So I think we're getting a little bit hung up on the 250 metre distance and whether that's feasible for a young person or an old person. The crux of the matter that I tried to get across in the refusal reason is more the location in terms of landscape and visual impacts and its isolated skyline location. So to me, there are far better sites within this farmstead down below along the access road lane that comes off, I think it's Rattle Hill Lane. We haven't had a good reason why we can't build there. You know, I've had a few reasons put to me, but they haven't been borne out by any technical evidence. So to take this decision and approve this today, I think would be a poor decision in landscape terms. You've got the, the advice from your landscape officer, which makes it fairly clear this is the wrong site. Um, and I, again, just to reiterate, I'm happy to have that further discussion should, should the application be refused today. Uh, and hopefully work at a better site for this way. Thank you. Yeah, can, can I just say before I go to the local member, I mean, we have to bear in mind that we'll have to explain this to a, literally hundreds, if not, of applicants who have to not have the site of their choice because of this condition that it, it is uh, special to farming. And I'm lucky in that respect. Um, you know, why they couldn't have on the, you know, the best site on their farm uh, over the recent years. And I've got at least four or five in my, in my area that have come to do that. So just bear that in mind. With respect, Chairman, that's irrelevant. No, each no, it, each it individual is application is, is judged on its own merit. No, no, it, it, is, it is part of the policy of the council. It has been, I, I disapprove of it. But uh, in many respects, but that is policy. The council. Sorry, Council Jerkin. Sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Um, if I may uh, take some, I make copious notes here. I thank the officer for his time and assistance with this matter. He has, he has been really, really good. But this is a need for an agricultural dwelling. A need. In both circumstances, for the applicant, it's on the site. That is of little or no use for farming. It's not a large field, not much of dirt, that's a technical term. And it's a need for an agricultural dwelling into the generations, as has been said. Going back to individual councils, the council of Boeing, you use the term convenient for the farm. The farm is right below the road, less than 250 metres away. And it is accessible within three minutes, as you've heard. And talking earlier on about um, Council Norman, going down in three minutes to walk in a, in a quad bike, if it's an emergency, they haven't got to get back up again. It's just down to the farm because it's a problem on the farm. And what does it mean by RA4, close proximity to the farm, as the officer said? Close proximity, I think, of 250 meters, 250 meters is close. Visibility. The site, when it's set down two meters into, into, the, into the dirt, as it were, it will be surrounded by trees and vegetation and will look like a barn. It will be obstructed for the long term view by trees. And I don't think it would look out of place. I would admit. When I first saw the first iteration of the plan, it, it was red, and it struck me between the eyes that it wasn't appropriate. So it was worked on, and we've come up with this 
situation you see now, we're a barn type agricultural construction. I don't agree, Council Norman, to be extremely visible, but it's designed, as I say, to look like a barn and to blend in with the landscape and not be something other than the landscape. <laughs> Light, lighting, that can be conditioned, you've heard the officer say that. Um, with regards to no services, you've heard the application will be furnished with PV for polyvitate panel for the electric, colour gas for the, for the oven. Drainage will be a packet deal, packet deal that will be put in on, to the, on the site. So it's, it's to all intents and purposes off the grid and it does actually work. And Councillor Harvey, I agree entirely with what you said. Going along Markle Ridge, which is so exposed, looking down on Lebri and beyond from Mormon, there are dozens and dozens of single dwellings stuck on the on the, land, on the landscape. One I can pick out, the Ridge Farm, which is on, on the on site, and it looks right out over the valley. So I think to say that this house, which looks like an agricultural building and will blend in will not be the same as the buildings that are now visible along Marple Ridge in their modern uh, styles. So Chairman, I, I, th I thank you for the opportunity to come back. And members, I would say this is, this is something of a need. You've heard the circumstances, a need into the future of some, somebody who has put together an application that does make it look like not a house but a barn. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Right, we now have a proposal which is the officers recommended as set out in the in the papers. Can I have those in favour of that recommendation? Can we just be clear on the recommendation, Mr. Chairman? Sorry? Can we be absolutely clear on the recommendation? The recommendation as set out in your agenda. Thank you. <clears throat> Those in favour, please show. Two, three, four, four, five, six. Those against. One, two, three. Extensions. One. Okay, that is refused. Can we now quickly move on to the um, uh, number eight? Yeah, but you will excuse me, I do have to go get my car MOT tested. Sorry? I do have to go get my car MOT tested. Yep. Okay, if you... This might take a... Minute. Hopefully won't take many minutes. Right, I, I, will, I will... Can I just... Okay. Get ready to go. By the mint of... Uh, in fact, this is only here because it, it is a relative... Uh, of the applicant is a re relative of a councillor <laughs> who incidentally is not a member of the committee. Um, and that is the reason why it has to come to the attention and its connection. So, uh, we have no speakers for this other than the local member, Councillor Fox. Um, Ms. Faye Griffiths, who is the officer, perhaps she can make her presentation. Hello, hi, good afternoon. Um, the property is a mid terrace dwelling located on the eastern side of 75 Bowen Street, Hereford. The location is shown by the red star on the map. Next slide, please. The dwelling is sited within the residential area characterised by similar style dwellings, with many properties also <coughs> extensions. Next slide, please. Planning permission is sought for the erection of a single story extension to the rear of the property to form a dining room. The extension would extend out in line with the previously approved extension and is approximately 3 metres long and 2.2 metres in width. Next slide, please. The extension would have an approximate 2.8 metre height on the boundary with the neighbouring property. Although the height of the solid brickwork element would be approximately 2.5 metres, rising to a maximum height of 3.5 metres against the host dwelling and the previous extension. Next slide. 
Christos. It is noted that the extension would result in an increase in heights on a boundary line to 2.8 metres. However, in my view, the relationship is not unusual in the context of a higher density terrace location such as this. The orientation and the presence of the existing <coughs> extension on a rear elevation is such that the immediate neighbours will not be adversely affected in terms of overshadowing. The glazing is at ground floor level and looks directly onto the applicant's own garden and the roof lights are for natural light only and so will not result in any loss of privacy. Next slide please. Proposed to be constructed in brickwork to match the existing walls of the dwelling, the lean-to style extension has been appropriately scaled and would be a subservient addition to the dwelling. Next slide, please. In summary, the proposal has been designed to read as a subservient addition to the character of the main property. The visual impact is limited to the scale, design and sympathetic materials. It is not considered that the proposal will have an undue impact upon the immunity of the neighbouring residents. The proposal seeks to provide security and privacy to the dwelling and its inhabitants with no impact upon the access. As such, the application is recommended for approval in accordance with the conditions laid out in the report. Thank you. Thank you. The local member is Councillor Fox. Hello, thank you. Thank you, that was a very detailed description. I won't repeat any of it. It all blends in beautifully and is a perfectly straightforward, acceptable um, application on Foley Street, which is uh, it's a, it's a one-way street, very, very small, and it will certainly enhance the house and life there. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Uh, I open the debate. Councillor Bowen. I propose um, approval of this particular application. Foley Street has any number of these rear extensions. Yeah. Right. Uh, is there anybody wishing to speak? No. <laughs> I know that there are no objections from oh. anyone. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> right. Then can we have the vote that's been proposed and seconded? Those in favour? Unanimous. That is carried. And thank you all. And thank